Flash of blades, rumble of guns, prologue. The ritual is nearing completion, High Lord Ziga began, addressing the assembled lesser lords and nobles that made up his council. The sacrifices have been assembled and the mages informed me just this morning that the altars of translocation are primed for use. General Tso, he nodded to the figure seated to his right, has assembled a force fit to conquer any world in its path. Yet this all begs the question, what will be the next jewel in our collection? Ziga, the undisputed leader of the 27 worlds that made up the Afauk Imperium, gazed down at the beings around him. They all had similar features to the High Lord, tall, thin bipedal builds with dexterous fingers and reverse-jointed legs. Each had a flat face with slit pupils and a round mouth hiding rows of sharp, tearing teeth. Bracketing their features were pairs of long, pointed ears. They represented the Afauk, the first race to discover the secrets of travel between realities and by far the most magically skilled of any known species. Using their arcane power, they had conquered 26 distorted versions of their home universe. Among them were 40 species of sentient creatures that now swore their loyalty to the Afauk overlords. And another would soon fall into their grasp. Lady Trenen, priestess of long visions spoke up first. Your greatness, she began, my agents among our most recently acquired realm have delivered some very interesting information. It seems that the lessers, a term that referred to beings of the same species as the Afauk, but who came exist in conquered territories, who once held sway had at one point developed a poor shadow of our own translocation rituals. This caused quite a stir. To even hint that the Afauk were not the undisputed masters in all fields magical bordered on sacrilege. Little good it did them, High Lord Ziga commented, caustically. The entire planet had fallen in under a month of campaigning. Dot. Quite right, sir, the priestess agreed, then continued. Rigorous interrogation of the heretics revealed, as expected, that they were inferior in all ways to our own. However, from their confessions we have learned of a potential target for our next attack. Three actually. At a gesture, the wall was covered in lettering and images. As you can see, two are uninhabited. Likely good sources of material wealth, but we lack the free population to exploit either properly. Instead, I recommend the third. A snap of her long, triple-jointed fingers caused the image of a bipedal creature in a rough tunic of some tanned animal hide to come to the forefront. This, she stated, is the dominant life form on the world. Superficially, it is somewhat similar to the Afauk, though the facial features are quite hideous. Many in the room suppressed hissing chuckles at the comment. After pausing a moment, Trena and resumed her presentation, however, their similarities only go skin deep. These barbarians have nowhere near our strength or speed. Their reactions are poor and senses dull. A century of life is the most they can hope for. Best of all, while their physical weapons are only somewhat less sophisticated than our own, they have no magical abilities whatsoever. None? An incredulous voice from the crowd asked. It wasn't an unexpected outburst, all things considered. After all, no sentient species had before been discovered without at least some ability to tap into the arcane arts. None might be as powerful as the Afauk, but it had long been postulated that magic and intellect were inseparably linked. Even if it wasn't, magic was instrumental in everything from communication to transportation to the Imperium's most powerful weaponry. Yes, you heard correctly. No magic, the priestess allowed herself a small smile of satisfaction. Our forces should be able to pacify them all in short order. At that point, we can put the subservient ones to work for the glory of the Imperium. Dot. Priestess Trenen, General Tso said from beside the High Lord, frankly, this sounds too good to be true. Are you certain of the intelligence? She nodded her head in reply and explained, General, I personally supervised the mind ripping of three heretics. Their accounts all agreed, and one had been among the groups that crossed to the world. And the last trip was only two generations ago. Five hundred years is not enough time for any race to advance to challenge our own, and they do not even have magic. The general grunted in acknowledgement and sat down again. In his place, High Lord Ziga stood. Priestess Trenen, I thank you for your analysis and concur with your findings. I also must commend you on your initiative. Should the attack prove as successful as you have indicated it will, 
I believe a governorship is in order, she positively beamed at that. Now, General, prepare your forces. We will conquer this, he consulted the screen, Earth in three days' time. And Trentan? I expect you to come up with a more suitable name for it by the time your service begins. Chapter 1 What was that? The question came from Corporal Artem Sokolov, 4th Guards Tank Division. He was sitting in the temporary barracks northwest of Moscow with the rest of his crew along with members of the rest of their armored platoon. With the exercise once again delayed, they had been playing cards, watching television, writing email, and generally taking advantage of their free time. That had all come to a sudden halt with the massive flash that had just streamed through the windows. A nuke? Are the Amos fucking insane? This drew a fair amount of shouting as men scrambled to their feet, suddenly nervous at the prospect of nuclear war with NATO. Though the Cold War was decades in the past, many had heard stories of those tense years and relations with the West were as strained as they had been in recent memory. Cut that out, Senior Lieutenant Vladik Popov shouted, dot that was no nuke. The television is still working, he pointed at the box blaring away in the corner. I felt no rumble. And there is nothing out there but forests. It would take someone quite a bit stupider than the Amos to nuke a few deer. His men calmed down, but that still left the burning question of, what the fuck was it, then? I do not know, Popov admitted. But even if it wasn't a nuclear weapon I doubt it was anything good. As if on cue, klaxons began blaring and a voice came over the intercom ordering all units to prepare for combat. Well, you heard our lords and masters, the lieutenant said to his assembled platoon, to the tanks. Horde commander Yuxasu grunted as his feet touched the ground and bared his tusks. It was his second translocation and just as disorienting as the first. The magical currents, flash of light, and sudden sensation of falling left most vaguely nauseous. More so, at least, than the sight of several bodies emerging from the trunks of nearby trees where they had fused with the wood. Death was just a part of life among orcs, and a certain number of casualties were expected in an arrival. But from the looks of things, it had been a successful translocation with no more than 3 or 4 percent casualties. He flashed a set of wickedly sharp teeth at the thought of the coming slaughter and then turned to address the sea of green, steel-clad bodies around him. Brothers! His magically augmented voice reached every ear in the horde. This land has been granted to us by our Afalk lords. It is ours for the taking, and by the divine right of conquest, I declare none shall stand in our way. Guttural cheering rang from the throats of the orc army as Yuxasu continued. But another species believes they can hold claim to what is rightfully ours. What say you? The roars of anger sent animals for scores of miles in every direction fleeing. I thought so. Now, go, like an unstoppable wave. Go and destroy any who stand in our path. With that he turned and began sprinting to where his runes of seeking told him the closest mass of life was centered. Dot around him almost half a million orcs raised their enchanted blades and let out battle cries to shake the very heavens. They were going to war. We don't know what they are, Mr. President, General of the Army Vitaly Ivanov told his head of state. They look like something out of a western fantasy movie, but they are here and less than 200 kilometers northwest of the capital. The entire cabinet was assembled in a bunker deep in the bowels of the Moscow underworld. It was fitting that the facilities were very similar to those constructed to survive the Nazis during the Great Patriotic War, a bet heavily modernized. These, however, boasted command, control, communications, and intelligence assets rivaling any other countries, including those of the United States. Now, they were showing images of hordes of creatures out of myth sacking the city of Tier. One particularly gruesome shot showed a pair of police being bodily torn apart by two-meter-tall green monsters for daring to show the slightest defiance to the brutes. The president of the Russian Federation frowned in contemplation. He was no stranger to the horrors of war, having been all too involved with such deadly arts in his youth. But he was not immune to the sheer surprise of having a force of this size suddenly appear so deep inside of the motherland. Finally, he spoke. I assume you have a plan, General Ivanov? Yes, Mr. President, the general said, nodding. Had it been an American briefing, he would have had a PowerPoint, half a dozen staffers, 
and a 50-page report for each member of the conference. Instead, he switched the main view on the wall-mounted flat screen to a tactical map and began speaking. The enemy is obviously making its way towards the capital. It appears to have paused to loot Fier, but we do not expect that to last much longer. Thankfully, their advance on the town averaged no more than 5 km per hour, so even if they break off immediately we will have time to prepare. It is unfortunate that we spent the last 70 years preparing for a war with the West. Most of our forces were deployed close to the border and we do not have any way to recall them in time to make a difference. On the other hand, elements of the 4th Guards Tank Division and 2nd Motor Rifle Division were preparing for a training exercise in this area, the general highlighted a section of the map between Moscow and the red icons indicating enemy formations. I have given orders to redeploy them to a forward position, along with elements of any units I can scrape up. The map zoomed in on a point closer to the red markers. This is the southwest point of the Ivankovo Reservoir. It represents a nearly 500-kilometer-long terrain obstacle protecting our northern flank. While it has several crossings, I have ordered them rigged for demolition. Any force will have to build their own bridge or go around. And if they are as impatient as I expect, they will take the southern route. That, he said, indicating the area on the map, is where we are positioning our men. The president once again considered the situation. Counts suggested their enemies numbered in the hundreds of thousands, and the units he was sending against them would be outnumbered 20 to 1. It was almost a total reversal of earlier Russian military situations, except the Nazis had never faced odds that bad. But it was the only option they had, and everyone knew it. Very well, General, he said, slowly, I approve of your plans. I hope they do not disappoint. Chapter 2 It has to be a trick. A stupid M.E. trick, Junior Sergeant Petrov muttered from the gunner seat of the T-14 Armada tank nicknamed Terrible. The vehicle, nearly 50 tons of composite armor and death-dealing machinery, was currently belly down inside of a hastily dug fighting position. Nearby were the other three tanks of their platoon, with the rest of the division spread out to pour fire across the swampy expanse to their front. Dot. Will you shut up with your conspiracy theories, Sergeant? Corporal Sokolov asked from the driver's seat. Besides, you're giving them too much credit. Before the gunner could respond, Lieutenant Popov silenced them both. Hold your tongues. We will carry out our orders, and kill anything that threatens our homes. Does it really matter if the enemy is American, German, or aliens from space? No sir, came the reply, and Popov nodded. They were a good crew, and had served together for the past three years. Terrible even had some combat experience, having participated in the later part of the pacification of Ukraine. But fighting a handful of harassed and broken rebels was nothing compared to the flood of bodies approaching now, and the lieutenant could excuse some nerves. Good, now from the dust clouds to the north, I have a feeling that we'll be seeing the enemy any moment. Artillery had been firing for the past half hour and they had only been given the order to start their engines 15 minutes ago. The sound and smell of diesel had filled the land, a tangible expression of human defiance. Now, as the crump of the short-ranged mortars began, Pavov knew they would be soon be going to war. Yes, he thought, it will be very soon indeed. Yuxasu snarled as another explosion lifted a dozen of his warriors up and slammed them back to the dirt. Orcs were tough and resilient, with enchanted armor making them even more so. After a few moments, at least half of the group was back on its feet. But no magic the horde commander had ever seen could have stopped the entire blast, and at least five bodies remained splayed around the crater, leaking green blood from eyes, ears, and scores of holes the jagged bits of hot steel had left. What foul magic is this? He wondered to himself, not for the first time. Their Afalk lords had sworn that this race had only mundane arms, unenchanted versions of his own weaponry. Yet here they were, raining fire from the skies. Dot but, he admitted, there wasn't the slightest hint of magic emanating from the blasts. It was like nothing any orc had seen, and it did frighten a small, hidden part of Yuxasu's mind. He quickly suppressed them. Such doubts had no place in an orc warrior, much less a horde commander. Then he saw it there was a break in the forests ahead. With a practiced ease, 
he vaulted to the top of a boulder and began to shout encouragement to his forces. For all their fury, the explosions were mere pen pricks compared the sheer numbers under his command. Together, they would roll over these pests to get to the riches beyond. And if by some miracle the defenders proved to be too tough a nut for his orcs to crack, Yuxusu had a couple of surprises he was sure would finish the job. They appeared on the horizon, slowly at first, then in the hundreds and thousands as they emerged over hills and from stands of trees. It was an army of Russian proportions, and the defenders steeled themselves to dive to the last in defense of home and country. From the way it looked, that might be exactly what was going to happen. The human forces were laid out in an L-shaped formation with the long end anchored by the southern edge of the reservoir and the short leg angling northwest between the Lama and Shosha rivers. All told, they covered a 10-kilometer front with 30,000 combat troops and over a thousand armored vehicles. Sadly, there had been no time to lay more than a handful of mines in the rush to relocate and prepare fighting positions. There were some artillery scattered anti-personnel devices peppering no man's land, but only a limited number had been available. The defenses thickened slightly nearer to the defensive lines, with quite a few Mon 50s, the Russians' version of the American Claymore, placed as last-ditch insurance policies. But for all its strength, they were stretched thin. There was no reserve, no fallback position. A breach here would spell doom for tens of thousands if not more. Dot. As the York Mass entered the swampy region two kilometers away from the Russians, the heavy weapons began to bark their fire. Auto cannons, machine guns, and grenade launchers began opening up on the attackers. More than a few small arms began to bark as snipers with their long-ranged rifles began to engage any orc that looked to be trying to create order out of the chaos. Such fury hadn't been unleashed on Russian soil since the Great Patriotic War over eight decades before. But between enchanted armor and weight of numbers it wasn't enough to do more than slow the tide of bodies ahead of them. At a thousand meters, the general infantry lent their weight to the Holocaust. AK-12 assault rifles and PKP light machine guns opened fire, sending tens of thousands of rounds down range per second. Individually, the 5.45 mm bullets from the AKs weren't able to penetrate the magically augmented armor of the Orcs, especially from such a long range. Together, and especially combined with fire from the larger 7.62 mm projectiles out of the PKPs. More Orcs went down, but still the masses came. Finally, when the frenzied mass of orcs had made it to just under 500 meters under the lash of the Russian guns, the tanks opened fire. Not with standard penetrators or even high explosives. Those would have been overkill for the soft bodies and light armor of the orcs, and not done any more damage than a single auto cannon shot. Instead, the units had emptied every nearby armory of a very special ammunition type. It was in limited supply, but there was enough every tank was equipped with a dozen of the shells. So the armor waited until the orcs were in optimum range before 200-125mm cannon spoke as one. Instead of one shot per gun, over 200,000 ball bearings screamed out towards the onrushing attackers. The canister shot cut great swaths through their ranks, killing thousands and wounding more. So great was the destruction that the orc advance momentarily paused, as if stunned by the fury of it all. Dot and then they fired again. All Yuxasu could do was watch as his warriors spent themselves in the meat grinder below. As befitted his seniority, he had stayed in shelter during the attack. The honor of the vanguard was for the young. Still, his heart burned for all the young fighters he had sent to their deaths. And not to honorable battle, but to slaughter. By the gods in hellfire, these creatures fought dirtier than the Afauk. But for all the horror of the destruction visited on the army, only a third had yet been killed. He rapidly issued orders to the remainder of his host, and then began preparations to bring in his special units. There was no doubt in his mind that he would break past the obstacle ahead of him. And if they were fighting so hard to protect whatever lay beyond, it must be a prize worthy of a king. And it would soon be his. Chapter 3 Still think it's an American trick? Corporal Sokolov shouted to Sergeant Petrov over the roar of the machine gun. They had expended the last of their canister rounds and were back to the 12.7mm coaxial cannon and the commander's machine gun up top. The ground around Terrible was awash in hot brass from the near-constant fire, and ammunition was beginning to run low. 
shut up corporal, I'm busy, their gunner shot back. And it was true, the Orkish force was nearly on them now. Already several units had been overrun. At one point, Sokolov had been in favor of sallying out and just crushing the enemy under their tracks. Now he was glad that the idea had been nixed. It seemed that these things had some sort of sword that could cut right through armor. There were already several tanks and quite a few armored fighting vehicles with holes cut through the 10 centimeter armor and the bodies of crew members scattered around the hulks. Despite the massive long range advantage of the Russian forces, these orcs outclassed them in close quarters. And the nearest were just over a hundred meters away from Terrible's position, close enough for the crew to see the frothing spittle dripping from gleaming tusks. Dot. I assume the hatch is closed? The sudden non sequitur came from Lieutenant Popov who had been monitoring the command frequencies. Yes sir, Petrov responded instantly. Good, was all platoon commander said in response. Sokolov was about to ask why when a new scream joined the background of fire. It quickly dopplered into a deep roar as a squadron of Su-34 fighter bombers passed over the lines, sleek silhouettes instantly recognizable. What weren't against the smoke-filled sky were the objects that fell from their hardpoints. The effects, however, plain for all to see. After all, only napalm created those vast waves of flame. Hundreds of green bodies turned into twisted black husks as they were consumed by the searing blasts of liquid heat. Another squadron screamed over and dropped anti-personnel cluster bombs on stunned groups of orcish warriors, killing still more thousands and then the Mi-24 helicopter gunships made their runs, machine guns flashing and rockets strobing. It was a scene from the depths of hell, with oily smoke blotting out the sun as flashes of explosions and cannon fire provided their own illumination. Even so, the horrible sight brought cheers from the beleaguered Russian infantry and armor. Then, the helicopters seemed to part for a moment, moving to the edges of the force. It wasn't an action born of mercy. The true purpose became clear seconds later as 12 BM-21s launched their full 40 rounds of 122mm high explosive rockets. They were unguided and had generally poor accuracy, but against an enemy spread out over 30 square kilometers, being a bit off target wasn't a bad thing. Shrieking tubes of high explosive and steel shrapnel exploded above the heads of the orcs still in the open. Despite enhanced armor and toughened bodies, the weight of fire left thousands more dead or dying and sent quite a few of the survivors running. The rapid succession of attacks had killed so many that it wasn't any surprise even hardened warriors fled. Dot. Unfortunately, just under half of the host remained, not yet having left the cover of the forest. These were among the hardest and most experienced members of the army, having allowed the younger warriors to earn their glory. And beside them marched the allies that had just entered the fight. Sergeant Petrov had been about to take back everything bad he had ever said about the Air Force when fires across the hellish expanse suddenly extinguished themselves in blasts of icy cold. Instantly, huge patches of the swampy land froze, allowing an easy passage for the full third of the remaining Orkish army. And among them were several hundred huge, shaggy shapes. These white-furred giants were almost five meters tall and the air seemed to shimmer around them sort of like the waves of distortion you saw on a hot road in the middle of the summer, but from the white frost that appeared wherever they stepped no one could believe for an instant they were from heat. Bullets seemed to shatter as they touched that shimmering field, instantly cooled to near absolute zero, the air resistance crushed them into powder. The crew of Terrible watched in horror as one pointed an arm at a squad of infantry. There was a flash of light and then a dozen frozen statues broke apart as they fell to the ground. Popov was the first to recover. Fuck this shit, he muttered. Then, much louder, and over the platoon frequency he ordered, gunners. Load heat. These things like the cold, huh? Well, then they'd see what a stream of superheated copper plasma would do them. Target the big bastards. And on my command. Fire. Four tanks each sent a shot screaming down range. Moments before their tips touched the protective magic, proximity fuses sent a burst of electricity to the explosives buried within. A fraction of an instant later, the shaped charges detonated. From the blasts, four jets of metallic gas and plasma shot forth. The supercooling effect cooled weakened them somewhat, so it was merely liquid copper that impacted the frost giants, 
Dot, but it was liquid copper striking unprotected flesh. And it was traveling several times the speed of sound. Every one of the targeted giants went down like puppets with cut strings, charred and gaping holes smoldering. Grinning ferally, the lieutenant ordered, Gunners. Continuous fire as you bear. As more tanks joined in, the frost giants quickly fell, and with them the hopes of the horde. When the helicopter gunships joined in with their own rockets, their fate was sealed, and their small size made for excellent targets. That still left the better part of 150,000 orcs pushing their way towards the Russian lines, but with the Air Force finally on station there was an easy answer to that problem. High above the battle, without the smoke and flames clouding the sky, a pair of two 160 bombers had just arrived. They had been delayed by the long distance they had traveled, there only being a handful in service. Their payloads weren't all that common, either. A small nuclear bomb would have been perfect for the mission they were planning. Unfortunately, using one would have violated quite a few international treaties that Russia still had to pay at least lip service to. Not to mention releasing that much fallout so close to both friendly troops and Moscow itself was generally considered to fall under the category of a bad idea. So neither bomber carried a nuclear warhead. Instead, they carried the next best thing, and at a signal a single enormous bomb fell from each. Far below, armored vehicle crews nervously checked their seals while the infantry crowded inside thanked their lucky stars they had made it. Outside, those unfortunate enough to lack airtight shells scrambled to find any cover they could, mouths open to equalize the blast they knew was coming. And then, in the middle of the swampy wasteland, a pair of weapons the world knew as the father of all bombs detonated in near nuclear fury. The airburst weapons each scoured a circle over half a kilometer in diameter free of life. Dot beyond that, the pressure wave was still enough to crush chest cavities and send orcs flying for some distance. When the Russians looked out viewports and above the lips of trenches, the line of screaming green warriors was gone. In its place were a pair of looming, dark mushroom clouds. Not a single orc emerged. So, it has come to this, Yuxasu muttered. His forces were defeated. He understood this. Though they still outnumbered the accursed apes, there would be no reforging any discipline they once had. Those last blasts had annihilated the front ranks so utterly there was no blaming those following for their flight. They were broken and only time could heal those wounds. Time, or seeing their enemy smashed completely. The horde commander reached into his armor and withdrew a small pendant. It was innocuous enough, a handful of small gems set in a plain silver disc. But appearances were deceiving. In fact, the trinket contained the life force of a thousand slaves, sacrificed at an Afauk temple during its forging. The device was not something to be used lightly, but if it was a choice between that and failing utterly, Yuxasu would not shirk from his responsibilities. As he intoned the sacred words, he reflected on what this would mean. He knew that upon the completion of the spell, he would cease to be. It required an intelligence to direct it, and he would force that duty on no other. But if he could smash the human lines, his forces would rally under his second-in-command, and the remainder could still claim victory for their people. As Clay began rising from the ground and encasing his body, he reflected that there were worse ways to die. Oh, what now? Corporal Sokolov nearly shouted as a new rumbling began. But this was unlike any that had come before, more like a series of gradually increasing earthquakes than a continuous noise. Its source became rapidly apparent as what looked to be a hill began walking over battlefield. Its steps were slow, but each carried its 200-meter height over an enormous distance. Dot in fact, the masses seemed to be settling. It now looked almost like one of the creatures they had been fighting all this time. A pair of gunships made a strafing run on the massive form. If their machine guns and cannon did any damage anyone could tell. The rockets seemed to have more effect, blowing craters in the surface of the monstrosity. But they were like the stings of an ant compared to the sheer size of the thing. Then, as if they truly were insects, the titan aimed a swat at them, arm moving at blurring speeds. One managed to dodge the limb in an incredible acrobatic display. The other was less lucky, and the gunship was reduced to flaming wreckage as it hit what was effectively solid ground moving at almost a hundred kilometers per hour. Every man and vehicle began to shoot at the monster, but they had little better luck. After all, 
how much can bombs and bullets really hurt solid earth? Things became even worse as a beam of pure, white energy shot forth and incinerated a swath of the defenders. Two tanks, four fighting vehicles, and almost a hundred men were vaporized in an instant. Seconds later, another blast shook the lines. This time, it was much closer to terrible, and a flashing light captured Lt. Popoff's attention. That was the company commander's tank, comrades, he said over the company command frequency. With Captain Markovich already dead, I am formally assuming command. His voice was calm, but with an edge of steel not even he knew he had. For a moment, Popoff paused considering his options. They seemed to flow through his mind in an adrenaline-spawned eternity that lasted all of two seconds. In the end, there was only one choice that made sense. All tanks will load penetrators. I want you to fire on the point I designate. Using the laser rangefinder, the senior lieutenant painted a patch of the monster's chest. As the golem turned to face them, eyes glowing and energy building, still he refused to give the order. Not until the last acknowledgement had come and the final adjustments were made did he give the word, fire. The nine remaining tanks of the company spoke as one, sending their depleted uranium penetrator straight into the titan's chest. Dot each was capable of cutting through almost a meter of steel armor. Together, they could have shattered a skyscraper. Against their target, they ought to have had little effect. The being was, in fact, essentially a mud golem. The shot should have entered one side and passed out the other, trailing dirt derbies as the holes closed up behind them. And every one of them did zip straight through the mass as if it wasn't there. But along the way, they generated waves of pressure strong enough to crush flesh into a pulp. Much like water, the muddy substance made an excellent conductor for the shocks. The body of Horde Commander Yuxa Su was situated in the exact center of Monster's chest. No longer precisely alive, nor completely dead, it served as a nexus for the massive energies controlling the magical construct. The pressure waves from a single one of the penetrators that passed just meters away would have been enough to shatter that nexus. The shot from Senior Lieutenant Popoff's terrible passed right through the former Orc Horde commander's remains, rendering them indistinguishable from the mud surrounding it. Instantly, the hulking form, now only a few hundred meters from the Russian lines, lost cohesion. It was as if whatever was holding the mud together vanished and it returned to its natural state, pulling into an enormous, shapeless mound. The troops that had until moments before been fighting for their lives all stopped, frozen. Then, slowly at first, but with growing intensity, the cheers began. They were cheers of men that had not only been granted a reprieve from the hangman's noose, but got to see their executioner strung up in their place. It was a cheer picked up by the civilians behind the lines and one that traveled through town and city until it reached the heart of Moscow and became something more. Inside the tanks the noise was muted by their armor. So when Corporal Sokolov motioned to his lieutenant, they were still able to understand one another. Dot sir, he said, pointing to his cell phone, a worried expression on his face, I was just checking the news and, well, it looks like we weren't the only ones facing something like this. Chapter 4 it looks like we'll make it after all, Colonel Asher Levi told his commander, Brigadier General Kaufman. They were standing on the banks of the Suez Canal, watching the masses seething masses of soldiers, refugees, and military vehicles streaming across the Al Salam Bridge. More were being loaded and unloaded by the dozens of ferries and small boats, working like madmen to ferry the crowds that had gathered. Beyond them, still hidden amongst the barren desert sands, was an army the likes of which had never been seen on earth. About half of that army had gone north to attack the heartland of Israel. From all Kaufman had heard, the IDF was preparing quite the welcome for them. But here, in the canal occupation zone, the issue was still in doubt. Unlike the last time Israel had occupied the Suez, they had actually been asked to take possession of the Strip by the Egyptian government. Well, by the legitimate Egyptian government. The country had been in a state of civil war since the early 2020s with the government and loyal military controlling the capital and most land east of the Nile. Most other parts of the country were held by ISIS-aligned rebels along with agitators from Sudan and Libya. After Mossad had uncovered and foiled the attempt to bring dirty bombs into the country through the Suez Canal, 
and lacking the forces to properly cover their own eastern flank from the growing rumblings coming from the new Caliphate of Arabia that had replaced old Saudi Arabia, they had invited their old enemies to once again take possession of the Sinai for the duration of the hostilities. Jerusalem, eager to help stabilize one of its neighbors in what was rapidly becoming one of the most chaotic on the planet, had rapidly agreed and dispatched the Golani Brigade, 400 First Armored Brigade, and sundry attached units to the vital transit way. Dot. The move had drawn serious international criticism, as such things usually did. Opposition from the UN, neighboring nations, and some portions of developed nations had resulted in many strongly worded condemnations. But despite the cries of warmongering and imperialism, it had allowed the Egyptian government to divert enough troops from securing their rear to start making real headway against the rebels. Internal IDF analysis indicated that Egypt would have pacified the northern oil fields in the next year. With oil and the revenue it brought in secure, the country was expected to be able to keep its own head above water and the IDF could withdraw to their homes in the north. Or that had been the expectation. No one was sure what would happen now. Thank you, Colonel, the General said, nodding. He was a short, balding man of middle age, with a complexion darkened by years in the harsh, desert sun. Have there been any other updates from command? No sir, the executive officer replied. Or at least, nothing useful. Wavs in the area report what looks like cavalry. Old style, not armored vehicles. Then they report bright flashes and cut out completely. Same with any manned fighters in the area. Even a cruise missile off the Hanit went down well before it reached the target. Well I guess the Samson option is off the table, then, Kaufman quipped, only half-jokingly. If ever there had been a place suited to the use of nuclear weapons, the Sinai was it. Nothing like no cover and not a bit of collateral damage in sight to make strategists cackle with glee at the very thought. But that would require a delivery system, and it looked like those were out of the question. A sad thing, too, sir, Colonel Levi answered but at least we'll have everyone on this side of the canal in about four hours. We expect it to take at least six for the forward elements of the enemy formation to arrive. The general thought about it for a time. Six hours until battle. Dot it wasn't anywhere near what he'd like, especially considering the nearest allied forces were quite a bit further than that to the east. He personally knew several of the Egyptian commanders and found them competent, if more than a little under-equipped. Their military still used quite a bit of technology dating back to the Cold War and their training standards weren't up to the IDF or those of most major powers. Still, Kaufman would have given quite a bit to have a few of their units backstopping his own. Bimpaya Fong, chief war mayor of the battle herd, examined the scene before her. The barren desert stretched endlessly behind, but ahead was the first strip of green she had seen on this new world. Soon, she could shake the sand off her hooves and once again enjoy the feel of solid ground instead of this shifting affront to nature. Her people had come to be on grasslands and gently rolling plains. Their lower bodies resembled nothing so much as tailless horses, and their strong legs let them travel for hours at a speed that would leave two legs in the dust. To the front of that powerful frame rose a more humanoid frame. Unlike the centaurs of myth, it was not the body of a man, the short, coarse fur and long manies that covered the rest of their bodies did not stop at the waistlines. However, they had a set of arms ending with dexterous hands and a head that had features resembling a flatter tooth to falc below the hair. Those arms could wield spears, swords, and bows with lethal prowess, as the war mare and her ancestors had shown countless times throughout the years. Around a fong were gathered her closest advisors and lieutenants. They had been through many campaigns together, all in the name of the Afalk Imperium. It was the only higher power they had known for centuries, and not one felt anything but total loyalty for their lords. And that loyalty was repaid with trust and the honor of leading one of the first invasion waves into a new world. Dot it was enough to make her head swim with pride. Of course, her people weren't alone. True, with over 100,000 of her fellow centaurs in this force, they were the most numerous but another 3,000 Afauk battle mages followed them. To be sure, these were lesser Afauk, not the true lords of the Imperium. No centaur would ever dream of commanding even the most minor high Afauk, but these were nearly as skilled as their betters and were totally subservient to Afong's will thanks to powerful enchantments of obedience. 
it did irk her that her people required such support, though she admitted their skills were rudimentary in the magical arts. A part of the war mare wished she had more troops under her command. There was no such thing as a stampede that was too large, after all. But the rest of the herd had gone north to combat the larger, more powerful foe there, and she didn't begrudge them the extra power. Besides, she had been able to unsaddle herself of that Ofkai in the split, and that alone was worth the loss of quite a few warriors. Despite every indication to the contrary, the stallion believed himself to be the god's own gift to the multiverse, and used his noble birth as a shield against any recourse. It would have been bad enough if he had been her junior, but the hoof licker had managed to gain overall command of this portion of the translocation. She had actually been relieved when the oaf had sent her to claim what was to all indications a secondary prize. Now, it looked as if battle was about to be joined, and she pushed such musings out of her thoughts. Ahead, she could just catch glimpses of an enemy scurrying behind their ditch. No matter, her centaurs weren't afraid of a little water. Soon enough, they would be across and enjoying the spoils of war. Turning, Chief War Mayor Bimpaya Fong let loose a powerful battle cry that resounded throughout the mass. Soon, the desert was thundering with the sound of hundreds of thousands of hooves propelling their owners towards the small, human force. Dot. As the dust clouds in the distance resolved into the monstrous herd, the men and women of the IDF detachment steeled themselves. Artillery had been thundering with a purpose, sending dozens of 155mm shells per minute from the three batteries of M109 self-propelled howitzers. The tightly packed enemy on open ground should have been an ideal target for massed artillery fire. Instead, many of the shots seemed to detonate prematurely or were deflected. Relatively few centaurs were killed by a bombardment that should have killed thousands. It was obvious that the shimmer surrounding the horse-shaped creatures was from more than just the desert heat. They were less lucky when over a hundred Merkava main battle tanks opened fire as one. Rather than anti-armor munitions, these were loaded with proximity-fused fragmentation rounds that burst upon just ahead of the enemy, sending thousands of fragments of notched steel wire into their forms. The individual projectiles were traveling too fast for the mages to intercept in time and the front ranks of centaurs fell. Follow-on shots were less effective as the magical adepts shifted their protective fields, but many were still able to punch through. Mixed fire from the medium and heavy machine guns of infantry and the scattered Namar IFEs added to the growing number of dead on the far sands. Under the onslaught, the approaching enemy appeared to falter, and for a moment it appeared that they might turn back from the fierce resistance. Suddenly, eruptions of sand diverted the defenders' attention. Hundreds of shapes launched themselves across the 300-meter gap of water in explosive clouds. These new attackers were small, tan-colored beasts, about the size of a large dog. In fact, it rapidly became apparent that they had been formed of the very desert sand, as infantry began opening fire on the newcomers. They died easily, a single bullet often enough to reduce them back to the dust from whence they came, but there were easily thousands of the fast little killers. Dot dozens of soldiers were killed or injured by the sand demons, slashed by sharp claws or torn by gaping maws nor were vehicles immune to the assault. Several APCs were caught with their hatches open and the beasts swarmed inside, killing crews and wrecking controls. Others threw themselves at engine compartments, reducing themselves into clouds of choking sand that clogged even the most robust machinery. One even managed to render a tank inoperable by throwing itself in front of the barrel an instant before it fired, damaging it beyond safe use. But they were individually weak and for all their viciousness, they were no smarter than mere animals. It only took minutes for the defenders to rally and kill the last of the demons. Squads formed up in circles or backed up against walls. With clear lines of fire and no danger of being flanked, the infantry were able to shrug off the attack. Not that it didn't do exactly what it had been intended to, General Kaufman thought bitterly as he holstered a pistol he had just used to put down one of the monsters. They distracted us just long enough for their forces to close the gap. The army of centaurs was now arrayed directly across the artificial waterway from the IDF, and had begun their attack in earnest. For all their primitive appearances, they had powerful weapons at their disposal. Like horse archers of old they were armed with bows, but while most were simple steel tips, a handful had been enchanted by some sort of magical enhancement. On impact, they would burst into blinding flames, 
almost like points of concentrated thermite. This fire produced a heat so intense that armor would melt and sag around it. Within the space of minutes, a dozen vehicles were destroyed, and at least 40 of Kaufman's troops went with them. Pull back to secondary positions, the general growled to his RTO. Armor first, with infantry covering. Then troops by sections. He had hoped that by placing his initial positions near the waterline, they would be able to engage the enemy with the best possible fields of fire. Dot it looked like that had been a mistake, though several thousand of the horsemen had been killed in the exchange. But despite the obvious unknown nature of the threat, Kaufman admitted he had underestimated the danger because of its primitive appearance. He just hoped that the error wouldn't prove deadly to the rest of his force. Chapter 5 They are running away! shouted one of Bimpiafong's subordinates, gleefully. He sent another arrow flying towards the humans. It burst harmlessly against the sand, scattering dust and flames across the desert at least ten meters away from its target. Not that the miss mattered too much in the grand scheme of things. Their quivers, like the rest of their supplies, had all been enchanted to replenish themselves from stores worlds away. Their logistics train was non-existent, yet their lines of supply were perfectly secure. That was no small concern for an army of any size. Still, it was a stupidly obvious observation. Obvious in that the humans were retreating stupid because that well-executed withdrawal was far from running away. Those were not the movements of a routed force, and even with their magical barriers, her forces had been mauled by the brief exchange. Between the fire from the sky, the blasts from their enormous metal chariots, and the small arms of their infantry, almost a half of a sixth of her own army was dead or dying. Fool, she said mildly to the overly exuberant youngster. He was one of her sons, after all, and it wouldn't stand to dash his spirits too much. Do those look like frightened sheep to you? As a nearby centaur dropped with a loud thwack as a bullet struck home she shook her head. No, they still fight, simply from further away. Why? It was a question the boy's mother obviously knew. But experience was the best teacher, and she hoped her foal would one day follow in her hoofsteps. It was why she had arranged for his presence here, after all. And, to his credit, it only took him a few moments to answer. Not they can hurt us from further than we can hurt them, he said, looking simultaneously deflated and expectant. He can learn, the war mare said, but without rancor. And it was true. The humans had retreated past the point where her own archers could reach them, while they continued to pour fire into their own ranks. Admittedly, much of the fire was still being absorbed by their magical barriers, but they were still taking a toll for no return. And what would you suggest we do about it? This time the young stallion had the answer ready. We use the lesser Afauk. At this, Afong let loose a wide-lipped grin. Quite right my boy. General Kaufman had just begun to feel a slight hope when the first ball of light struck. It came from within the mass of milling bodies across the Suez and hit a low building holding a platoon of IDF riflemen. The explosion rumbled through the city like that of a small bomb. When the dust cleared, eight defenders were dead and another twelve were wounded. Seconds later, another ball of light streaked out, hitting a Merkaba tank on the front glassy. It burned straight through the refractory composite armor and into the compartment beyond. The blast from the exploding ammunition killed the crew instantly and sent the turret flying 20 meters into the air. The dead tank's two platoon mates instantly turned and fired at the source of their companion's killer. Two high explosive shells streaked across the several hundred meters and exploded. Against nothing. Not a single fragment passed through the invisible shield protecting two dozen figures as they chanted and waved their arms in intricate patterns. Another tank died in the same manner as the remaining survivor of the armored platoon fired one more shot. Unlike the others, this was a depleted uranium penetrator designed to penetrate the equivalent of a meter of solid steel. It bounced off as if it had been a children's toy hitting a brick wall. The general cursed as he watched the last of the three tank platoon explode, its machine guns firing until the end. Dot slow firing this new threat may be, it could take out his own tanks with ease while shrugging off hits from the most powerful weapons under his command. He very briefly considered falling back, beyond visual range of the new threat, and letting his artillery engage the threat. 
The idea was short-lived as he watched a ball arc over a small building to hit the mortar battery beyond with unerring accuracy. And now more orbs of searing death were being hurled from scattered knots across the lines. Each one took with it a vehicle, building, or group of soldiers. Kaufman searched desperately for something, anything, to use against this seemingly unbeatable foe. His troops were dropping like flies, and a few more minutes of this would see their end. Then, Colonel Levi touched his shoulder. Sir, look. He pointed a long arm at the so far unused air defense element attached to his command. Designed primarily to knock Soviet-era missiles and artillery out of the sky, he doubted it would be able to acquire mystical balls of fire, much less stop them. Oh. He said, understanding dawning. It was a long shot, and if it worked it would violate several international treaties. But those treaties didn't say anything about horsemen and elves. And when the inevitable media smear campaign and international furor appeared, well, at least he and his people would be alive to see it. Lasers were a relatively new weapon on the modern battlefield. They were big, bulky, and had none of the stopping power of a bullet. In fact, it took several seconds of concentrated fire for a beam to melt through the steel surrounding an artillery shells they were normally used against. Against infantry, the beam would cause severe burns, but not the sort of sudden death or disintegration that bad science fiction often showed. This hardly mattered to the hundred of out mages who were targets of the iron beam laser defense system. Rather than attempting to kill each individual spellcaster, the operators instead played the beam over the crowd over the course of seconds. Dot the effect was instantaneous. Each and every one of the battle mages fell to the ground, screaming in pain and clutching their eyes, eyes that had suddenly been burned by a light hundreds of thousands of times brighter than the sun. As they lay there, writhing, dozens of infantry took them under fire. Unable to concentrate through the intense pain, they were dead in seconds. Gears turned and motors whined, then the trailer-mounted system focused its fire on another group of lesser efalc. They, too, suffered the same fate, along with dozens of centaurs unlucky enough to be standing in the same area. With every shot it made, another contingent of mages went to their knees, only to be finished off by fusillades of lead. Even with eyes screwed shut, the beams were still powerful enough to permanently blind their targets. Turning away from the beam wasn't enough as the reflection from the sands was enough to leave anyone nearby dazzled for hours to come. Unfortunately, Lasers were a complex piece of technology. Tested and based on well-understood principles, yes. But not something that stood up as well to adverse conditions as projectile weapons. It was only a matter of time before something failed. It just so happened that after 20 near-continuous shots, a tiny imperfection in the fiber-optic channel finally took just a bit too much. The glass shattered, reducing the beam into a decoherent blob. While safeguards shut the beam off well before any more damage could occur, it would be out of action for at least the next several hours for repairs. But in their wake, they left nearly 900 mages and 6,000 centaurs blind and easy targets for the IDF regulars scattered across the front. There were just enough magic users in the army to maintain the shields that kept them from being utterly destroyed by the human weapons, but they were weaker, more vulnerable to small arms and artillery. Those reaped a bloody harvest, firing into the disorganized and suddenly vulnerable mass that had just killed so many of their own. Dot with half of her battle mages dead, a third of her army lying in the sands with them, and no way of knowing that the human laser was offline war Mara Fong was forced to order a retreat. 40,000. That was how many of her brothers and sisters she had left behind on the banks of that accursed waterway. Or as near as any of her subordinates could tell her. That was in addition to the 1700 Ifalk battle mages, better than half of her magical element, lying alongside. And for what? A handful of dead humans? She realized now that there had been no need to retreat. Whatever weapon had blinded so many had spent itself. They had been in view during the entire retreat, and while hundreds had fallen from artillery and rifle fire, none were lost to this new threat. Great Mother, a voice spoke from her left. She recognized her son's voice and beckoned him to approach. Mother, I have spoken to the mages and believe they can defeat the human's new weapon. It is merely light. Bright, surely, but a simple spell should blot out anything sufficient to burn our eyes. It's too late, she said, tiredly. 
a good idea, but the time has passed. Would they have not continued to use their searing light had they been able? No, we were driven away like a herd of wild pigs afraid of a simple torch. And now we can't even touch the two-legged beasts. Maybe. Her son said, thoughtfully. Then his face grew wide with his own version of his mother's earlier grin. Then again, maybe not. Chapter 6 They're coming back, Colonel Levi said, as he entered the impromptu command post. ETA is 20 minutes to the canal. General Kaufman looked up from the report in front of them and sighed. Ask me for anything but time, he muttered, dropping the tablet. On its screen was the estimate for an amphibious relief force. From the little Levi could see, it didn't look good. Sound the alert and get the armor moving. Casualties had only been about 15%. Dot that was heavy for most units. In fact, to use the old meaning of the word, they had been worse than decimated. But compared to what they had inflicted in turn, the IDF had come out ahead. Unfortunately, they had expended nearly half their stocks of ammunition in the process, and without bullets their guns were nothing more than poorly balanced clubs. But if they could cause enough losses this time around, maybe the survivors would give up before they realized they could smash right through. Minutes later, the general was observing the approaching dust clouds from a hastily constructed bunker on a small hill. It was quite a sight, but not nearly as enormous as the first one he had seen. Good, he thought we bled the bastards. But as they approached, he saw that something was different. Before, they had descended in a wave. Now, the centaurs were in a line, almost like an armored column formed up on an imaginary road. As tanks began to fire and the shots bounced away from the army, he had to admit it made sense. But there was no way they could maintain a shield that strong across much of an area, so the units on either side would be able to engage the flanks as soon as they got closer. And as they approached, they did inflict serious casualties on the lightly protected flanks. And still the column came. Kaufman's eyes widened as he realized they weren't stopping. Hundreds of horsemen galloped over the edge of the Suez Canal. Not a single one fell to the water below. Instead, they appeared to be running on nothing, almost as if there was an invisible bridge under their hooves. It only took a second for the general to realize what had just happened. If a shield could stop an armor penetrator cold, it could certainly support the weight of any number of the horse-shaped invaders. Now that same force was on their side of the canal, and appeared to be spreading out. There was no way around it. If those horses got past the shield of armor and infantry, there would be no escape. Dot his artillery and rear area elements would be easy meat, and without the support they offered, their forces would be crushed in hours. That left one very unpleasant option. Kaufman calmly walked over to a wall and picked up a Tavor leaning against it. He pulled a magazine from his armor, tapped it to get rid of any dust, and seated it in the receiver. Then, turning to his watching staff he gave the order, we pushed them back. He said it simply, as if it was a fact of life. Then he began to walk out of the bunker. Before he left he turned around and simply asked, Are you coming? To their credit, the men only hesitated for a moment. With grim, determined faces, they grabbed helmets, rucks, and rifles, then followed their general to the front. Along with them, units from across the line advanced, rushing to get to their vacated forward positions before the enemy masses could overrun them. The sound of diesel engines and barking rifles met clattering hooves and hissing arrows. And then the battle was joined. Abraham Kaufman leaned back against the wall and took a long swig of water from a canteen. He savored the cool liquid against his dust and smoke-parched throat, then passed it off to the next soldier in the burned-out ruins they were huddling in. He doubted they'd get another chance to enjoy it, though. Every one of them could all hear the sounds of the horses forming up for another charge. And this time it would surely break their paper-thin lines. The IDF had, barely, managed to contain the attack to a small pocket. Half of men and women under Kaufman's command had died just in that initial counterattack but the survivors had held with stubborn tenacity. The Israeli armed forces had quite a bit of experience in urban warfare, after all, and the battle had become just that. It was house by house, street by street fighting, and the humans had held the line through skill, bravery, 
and sheer luck. But the close quarters brought their enemies' strengths into the fold as well. They were able to face the defenders with blade and steel. At close quarters, their weight of numbers was often enough to carry a charge into the human lines where swords, axes, and spears could do their deadly work. So one by one, the Israeli positions had gone silent. Now there was a thin, undersupplied ring of forces surrounding the centaurs. Any serious attack on that line would punch right through like a hot knife through butter. But as the general looked around at the men and women around him, he felt nothing but pride. These soldiers had fought against impossible odds, they had looked into the eyes of death and spat in his face. And even though they were fighting to protect a foreign land, not a one had given an inch of ground they hadn't soaked in the blood of the beasts and their own dead. These weren't the soldiers he had started with. They were a hodgepodge of remnants of shattered infantry squads, dismounted tankers, and support types who had picked up the rifles of fallen soldiers and taken their places at the front. Of his staff, Kaufman didn't know if any were still alive. Levi was dead. He had watched the man take a pike to the gut thirty minutes and a lifetime ago. That he had taken his attacker with him to the grave didn't matter much to those he had left behind. The rest probably shared his fate, though in the confusion it was possible they had just become separated. Not that it would matter in a few more minutes. He was seriously contemplating giving the order for one last, desperate charge. Better to die bringing the fight to these bastards than cowering in a hole, he reasoned. Just then, a figure slid into the ruins, clutching a rifle and carrying a radio on his back. Looking around, the man spotted the tabs on General Kaufman's shoulders and addressed him. Sir, he said, using English rather than Hebrew. That struck the general as odd even as he took in the uniform lacking any of the soot and grease and blood that stained the fatigues of every other soldier in the building. Dot in fact, they told me I might find you here. My commander wants to speak with you. The man, who Kaufman now saw was most certainly not Israeli, held out a headset and he took it. Kaufman, here, he said, speaking into the mic. Abraham. It is good to hear you still among the living. That voice. General Kaufman had heard it many times before. Abdul? Is that you? It is wonderful to hear you my friend. General Abdul al-Farsi was the leader of the Egyptian Second Field Army and a long-time acquaintance of Kaufman. Having come up through the ranks in the intense fighting the man was a strong leader who never passed up the opportunity to get his hands dirty. It was the sort of attitude that inspired a fierce loyalty among his men, and if he had the slightest inclination, Kaufman had no doubt they would have installed him as Egypt's ruler without a second thought. He was also a rather devious strategist as he had shown repeatedly over the years. But why am I hearing from you? Well, I would have phoned sooner, but you know how things are, ISIS attacking, monsters appearing, and you apparently forgot to pay your phone bill. I've been trying to reach you for hours, but every time I get that damn busy signal. Kaufman thought back to his RTO, lying on the ground with one arrow in his equipment and another in his neck, and shook his head so many good people. I have been a bit busy myself. But back to the matter at hand? The Egyptian general laughed. Of course, my friend. I just wanted to let you know that I'll be dropping by in the next few minutes. And I hope you don't mind that I invited some others along. Just a few thousand of my closest friends. I do hope you didn't end the party without us. For the first time in a long time, Abraham Kaufman felt a smile on his lips. Why general? I wouldn't worry about that. It looks like there's still plenty to go around. Chief War Mayor Bimpaya Fong looked around bleakly. Dot they had been close. So close. And somehow the humans had managed to snatch victory from the jaws of defeat. As she watched, another armored behemoth, this one subtly different from the one she had fought previously, fired and a line of her warriors fell like grass to the scythe. The few remaining lesser afalk were too few and too exhausted to block even a fraction of the fire now pouring from all around. It truly was from all around as well. Somehow, the apes had managed to get their own fighters to the far side of the canal and though few in numbers, the band seemed to be incredibly well trained, picking off any centaur that showed even the slightest inclination to rally their survivors. Her son, her only son, had been one of the first victims of their fire throwers and she could still see him in her mind's eye. One moment, 
tall and proud in his moment of victory, the next, his head had exploded like an overripe melon. It was too much. A Fong let loose an enraged war cry and charged at the human lines. Maybe if she was fast enough, strong enough, she could at least take a few of them with her. She hadn't even made it halfway before the blast from an Egyptian tank painted the sands red with her blood. Once again, I must thank you for your timely arrival, General Kaufman said, smiling and shaking his Egyptian counterpart's outstretched hand. No, I must thank you, Abraham, Al Farsi replied, seriously. If your men hadn't been here. Well, I hate to think what these beasts, he gestured to the fields of dead horse shaped creatures and the handful being led away at gunpoint, would have done to my country. We might have survived, but. He left the rest unsaid, instead trailing off into silence. The thought of the ravaging hordes loose amongst the civilians living crowded along the Nile was too terrible to contemplate. Kaufman nodded somberly. But it was a timely arrival, nonetheless. And you are sure none escaped? I would hate to see what a band of them could do to some of the smaller towns to the north. Dot. My Saka boys made sure of that, the Egyptian general responded. Sent them out to the dunes to stop just that from happening. A handful of the horses made the swim across. I don't believe a single one got more than fifty meters further. Good, good, Kaufman said, smiling. Now, as you know, I have been a bit cut off recently. Like you said, I forgot to pay my phone bill and those people are just too harsh about late fees. So, tell me, what has been happening in the rest world? General Al Farsi laughed and replied, Well, your own countrymen dealt with their infestation quite easily. Stopped them right at the border with massed armor and artillery. The Russians took care of their own infestation, as well and from what I hear, their stand was every bit as amazing as what you accomplished here. As for the Americans, well. Chapter 7 The shock slammed Commander Connor Ward, call sign Snakeskin, into his flight couch. Even though it was the largest carrier class ever designed and built the USS Enterprise, CVN-80, still had a brutally powerful launch system. The commander of the Kestrels, the 137th Strike Fighter Squadron, didn't let the impact distract him. In fact, he had been through over a hundred launches just like this one, and quickly brought his F-35 up to join the rest of the 6th Carrier Air Wing. Around them the weather was perfect. A handful of large, puffy clouds were scattered throughout the heavens with the aquamarine depths of the ocean below. But the beauty of the scene belied the purpose the aircraft flying through it as minutes later, they joined another 46 fighters off the USS Gerald Ford and turned to fly east at just over the speed of sound. Less than 20 minutes earlier, a massant satellite over the Sea of Japan had detected a flash of light resembling a multi-kiloton nuclear weapons detonation. Surprisingly, it hadn't been accompanied by the usual hard radiation or electromagnetic effects any normal explosion would generate. But the guided missile destroyer USS Mustin had detected an enormous flight of aircraft suddenly appearing in the same location and had alerted the rest of Carrier Strike Group 5 seconds before the nuke flash message arrived. The USS Gerald Ford and newly arrived USS Enterprise immediately scrambled their squadrons of F 35s and F A 18s to intercept the approaching threat. But if the sensors of every ship in the fleet hadn't been saying the same thing, no one would have believed the Mustin. In fact, Ward almost didn't believe what his own radar was telling him right now. If his gear was accurate, there were 800-plus distinct contacts 180 miles due northeast of their current position. Each and every one of them was showing up, clear as day on the feed he was getting from the AWACS attached to their wing. Even more oddly, they weren't radiating their own active sensors, despite making no attempt at stealth. There ought to be at least some sort of electronic noise coming from the formation, but sensors hadn't even detected a stray radio broadcast. Yet their size and metal content was about on par with a Cold War era Tu-95 bomber, despite only barely topping the stall speed of those behemoths. They can't all be real, Commander Ward thought to himself as his wingman, Lt. Simon Barman Durex, eased into formation behind him. Even if North Korea, and that was the only place this group could have come from, had bought every old bomber Russia had, cobbled together a few of their own, 
and managed to overcome their own terrible maintenance record long enough to get them all into the air they still could never have managed to put that many birds into the air at once. The Norks just didn't have enough pilots, fuel, or international support to pull a stunt like that off. In fact, from the odd fuzz he was seeing around some of the radar returns, Ward decided they must be some sort of decoy. Probably some sort of advanced ECM from the Chinese. Dot they might even have loaned it to the Koreans simply to have a deniable field test. It wouldn't be long until he and his pilots got to see whatever they were with their own eyes. Traveling at over 800 miles per hour, they would be in range of the bogies in just a few minutes. Then they'd see what they were really facing. Another flash, sir. PACCOM just routed it in. The communications officer handed over the sheet of paper to Rear Admiral Joseph Stiles. Two in one day, the tall, lanky man muttered. Someone must really love us. He accepted the tablet and began to enter his personal access code. Their mission in the Sea of Japan had been fairly routine, show the flag, liaise with units of the Japanese Self-Defense Force, discourage Chinese and North Korean aggression, and work up the USS Enterprise on its first real deployment. For the initial sea trials, the Admiral had moved his flag from the Ford to the newly launched Enterprise, and he had been impressed with both the crew and the ship's captain, Victor Feld. They'd performed well in the war games he'd set up with the Japanese and the speed at which they had reacted to this new threat was just icing on the cake. At the thought of the Japanese, he glanced out the bridge viewport towards the Izumo-class destroyer Kaga, floating half a mile to port of the Enterprise. He also knew that somewhere below was the Soryu attack submarine Kokoryu. Both had struck him as capable units, and the Kokoryu with her diminutive skipper, Commander Toru Nakano, had managed to sink the Ford during one of their simulations. Some of the stealth systems on that sub rivaled that of the Ohio-class USS Louisiana that was supposed to have been protecting her during the notional attack. Password accepted, the screen obediently displayed the short message. In the moments it took Stiles to read the note, a dozen thoughts raced through his head. The first was the firm belief that someone in high command had gone insane. Dot or that another 16-year-old was kid had managed to hack the Pentagon and was playing a prank. It was the only explanation for this nonsense. Orcs? In Russia? That was just insane. Then again, so was a force of 800 295s appearing out of nowhere. And a flash had been reported near the Russians. Order the fighters to engage, now. He barked, suddenly. The startled flight officer nonetheless turned to his board to begin to issue orders, but by then it was too late. Commander of Wings Wa Ely grinned evilly, rows of razor teeth glimmering in the sun as his long, raven-colored hair streamed behind him. Around him flew nearly a thousand of the Imperium's finest riders. It was a prestigious position in the hierarchy and only well-born higher a Falk were allowed to join. It was his status as third-born son of the High Lord Ziga himself along with a long and prestigious list of battle honors that had guaranteed this command. And while they weren't among the most powerful mages, their mounts more than made up for that. After all, who would dare fight a full-grown dragon? The mighty beast measured 40 meters from nose to tail and had a wingspan just a bit more than that. They were covered in metallic scales that would shrug off any conventional attack and while lesser beasts like the griffins were routinely swatted from the sky by mages, the internal magic of the drakes nullified any spells cast well before they could cause any damage. Of course, that made it nearly impossible for their riders to use their own defensive magic themselves and interfered with their offensive spells, but that wasn't a problem. With their fearsome claws, gnashing teeth, and deadly breath it wasn't like the riders needed to do much more than direct their charges. Bui's own was a massive specimen of red and black. They had fought their way through armies and rebellions across seven worlds, and while he couldn't bring himself to think of the beast as a living being, but shared experiences had raised it to the status of a near irreplaceable tool. Not what higher calling could any non afalc ever hope for, after all? The magic suppressing field did play havoc with communication at times. To that end, they had all been provided with particularly robust enchantments of long vision. Ely used his now to relay orders to the individual wing leaders that made up his formation. My mount tells me it senses a number of enemies approaching. They are few in number, but incredibly swift. If I understand the beast right, they travel faster than sound itself. There was some muttering at that last, but it quickly died down. 
Praise the High Lord, they appear small and there are ten of us for every one of them. By the strength of our mounts and the steel of our resolve, we will prevail. The cheers and war cries from his commanders widen the Afauk's smile even further. Switching the spell to send to the ear of every rider under his command, he said, Now, prepare your men and beasts. We will be meeting the enemy in mere minutes. And when they arrive, I plan to show them the futility of resisting the Imperium. The entire formation reverberated in cheers that drowned out the very wind. Chapter 8 what in the Fua voice over the squadron frequency began before the speaker fell off in incredulity. Cut the chatter, Commander Ward said sharply, though it was more out of reflex than conscious thought. The whole thing was insane, but there they were, clear as day. Shaking himself, he flicked over to the command channel. His squadron had been detailed to make a visual pass while the others maintained a holding pattern twenty miles out. Sir, we have. Well, they're dragons. There's no other word for whatever the hell these things are. Confirmed dragons, Captain Westbrook, the wing commander, said calmly. Of course, he also had the visual relays from the squadron's jets. New orders from the E-forces are confirmed hostile, engage at will. Suddenly, the closest group of dragons seemed to explode in flames. Dot balls of fire the size of cars were hurled towards the 137th like some sort of demonic shotgun blast. But fast as the incoming fire was, the F-35s were faster. Break! 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 Ward shouted over the squadron frequency as he brought his craft into a rapid climb. The fifth-generation fighters were designed to evade incoming seekers flying at several times the speed of sound. By comparison, the unguided and subsonic fireballs were just nuisances. Captain, he called flipping the radio back to the command channel, confirm hostile. Enemy force has opened fire. Literally, some sort of fireball. Easy to avoid at range, but looks nasty. Request backup. We're coming snakeskin, hang tight. Thanks sir. We'll leave you a few. Out. Commander Ward was already swinging his squadron around. This time he had no intention of getting anywhere near those fire-breathing lizards. At ten miles out, he gave the order, all kestrels, Fox 2. From the wingtips of each of the F-35s, a pair of AIM-9X Sidewinder missiles streaked out. The infrared-guided air-to-air -air missiles accelerated to Mach 3 and crossed the distance between the two forces in under 20 seconds. Easily picking out the large, hot forms of the dragons they bored in on their targets, detonating in flashes of shrapnel-filled fire. Dragons were tough. They had been bred to stand up against javelins, arrows, and crossbow bolts. Without magical enhancement, mundane weapons had no chance to scratch the incredibly hard scales that made up a dragon's hide, and the magical nature of the beast nullified all but the strongest spells and weakened even those. But several pounds of hardened steel propelled by high explosives was another matter. Of the 24 targeted dragons, only two managed to survive the experience. None of their riders were so fortunate. The Kestrels streaked past the Draconic Formation, giving it a wide berth as they rejoined the rest of the wing. As they did, they passed the literal cloud of missiles loosed by the rest of the American Formation. Dot almost 180 more sidewinders hit the cloud and the casualty rate was, again, near 100%. But as the orders came in to prepare for another volley, Ward got the sneaking suspicion things were going too easily. By the gods, what was that? Ely cursed the strange beast that had just flashed past. And, nearly a fifth of his command fell from the hellish projectiles they had loosed. The darts seemed to ride tails of fire, arrowing into their targets with incredible precision. He had seen one of his riders dive towards the sea to avoid the swarm, only to have two of the weapons arc downwards to reduce him into bloody chunks. Now his magically enhanced vision could just see the enemy coming around to pass once more. If they kept it up, soon the commander of wings wouldn't have a wing to command. Already he could see the uneasiness in the movements of his subordinates, jerky motions as if they weren't sure if they should press on or turn tail and flee. Activating his communication spell, Ely once again addressed his forces. Stand fast, sons of the Imperium. You are not children who would run to their mothers at the sight of their own blood. 
you are not craven cowards who would let the killers of their brothers walk free. You are riders of the Imperium. The words seemed to bolster the spirits of the men, so Ely continued. Now, our enemy is fast and has weapons of unusual power. But we will not shirk from our duty. We will crush this group as we have all others, and we will take their weapons for our own. For glory and the Imperium. And as the answering shout shook the heavens, the commander of wings knew what he was going to do. Fox 3. Fox 3. Commander Ward shouted. His two sidewinders exhausted, he had switched to firing AIM 120M ROMs. His fighter carried six of the heavier, longer-ranged missiles. Well, four now. But considering the success of the sidewinders he had no doubt that the faster and more powerful air-to-air -air weapons would do a number on the enemy formation. Dot he was just thinking about the pretty new silhouettes he was going to have Chief MacDonald paint onto his bird when the sky in front of the missile storm seemed to explode. A second later, both of the telemetry links went dead. It was easy to see what had happened. With their targets keeping straight and level, every one of the shots had come in on a direct course. And they had flown right into the massed fire of 800 dragons. And there went almost a quarter of their forces' missiles. All squadrons, break and engage independently. AWACS will coordinate vectors and timing. That was Captain Westbrook. It was the only order he could have given. Massed fire obviously wasn't going to cut it, but maybe they could get some hits in if they spread their fire. The Kestrels vectored out to the east, then coming around in a tight bank they fired off another volley. This time, there were hits. There were just damn few. Those dragons with their flexible necks and powerful breath could knock all but a handful of the missiles out of the air, no matter where they came from. They had to have inhuman senses and reaction times, but it was obvious that whatever these were, they weren't human. The monsters even managed to cover their six o'clock, simply spinning in mid-air to unleash fireballs. I don't have time for this shit, Ward muttered. Then he switched to the AWACS frequency. Control, Kestrel 1 taking my squadron on a close approach. Keep the air around us clear. Roger Kestrel 1, came the reply. The lane is clear. Good luck. Thanks Sky Eye. Out. He brought his squadron in on a steep dive, nearly vertical. As they shot down from the heavens, they spread out into pairs, presenting less of a target to the enemy. The fireballs came as they were less than a mile out. Ward jinked left, then up. He didn't bother checking for Barman, knowing his wingman would be glued to his six. Time seemed to slow as he passed through the enemy formation. A tone sounded and Ward pulled the trigger. Dot then he instinctively squeezed another, sending a burst of cannon fire into one of the flying behemoths as he passed. The whole run seemed to have taken hours, but it was only a pair of seconds before they were through. Well, most of us, the commander thought bitterly. Jackson bought it, victim of either fireballs or a mid-air collision, Ward couldn't tell. It looked like his wingmate Cyrus had clipped whatever had killed his partner and had ejected in time. Relief quickly died as one of the beasts reached the descending parachute. The cameras caught a brief glimpse of the flash of a service pistol firing futilely before the tall Latino was torn limb from limb. But behind the squadron, he saw the corpses of ten dragons tumbling down. It wasn't the best exchange. One for five sounded nice on paper until you realized the enemy still outnumbered you eight to one. Still, it was the only way they were going to manage to take enough of the flying lizards down to make a difference. Sky Eye, Ward called on the squadron control frequency, need a new attack vector. Admiral Stiles watched the returning fighters stoically. Considering what they had faced, they had done an amazing job. Over half of the dragons had been killed before the fighters had been forced to return to base to rearm. But it had cost them heavily. Almost 60 men and women, an entire wing and then some worth of pilots, wouldn't be returning home, and there were damn few rescue beacons in the water. SAR flights had already been dispatched for the ones there were, the helicopters skirting around the enemy formation. Some were probably getting closer than they ought to have but those crews were some of the best trained and motivated on the sea or below it. Not to mention a little insane, not that anyone would say it to their faces. Styles had no doubt they would get every one of the survivors or die trying. 
the thought of enemy that had cost his command so much brought his attention back to the formation on the tactical plot, a formation that was just sitting there. Dot they'd launched SAMs at it, but those had met the same fate as the air launched missiles. Those dragons knew the fleet was there, but either they didn't care or they were waiting for something. And given the losses they had taken to the fighters, he was willing to bet on the former. Message from the JADF, the calm officer said, looking up. Their homeland defense forces are up and they've detailed three squadrons of F-15s to assist. The Koreans are sending two squadrons of F-16s and one of F-35s. ETA is 30 minutes for the Japanese, 40 for the Koreans. I don't think we'll have that long, sir, a radar tech said, and the admiral's heart sank. I'm reading movement from the bandits. They'll be on top of us in 10 minutes. And how long until the fighters are rearmed? Stiles asked, already knowing the answer. We'll have two squadrons ready when they hit, flight ops responded. I don't know if we can have them launched before they get here, but the crews are willing to try. No, keep them below decks. They won't make any difference, the admiral responded. Make sure the phalanx are ready to fire. And give me another sonar sweep. I want to know why these bastards waited so long to come visit, and you all know I only like surprises on my birthday. While the crew went about their work, Stiles kept thinking. There was no way that a formation like that needed 20 minutes to reorganize. They had to be waiting for something. But what? He walked over to the sonar station and looked over the operator's shoulder. See anything, sailor? Ah, uh, no sir, the startled lieutenant said. Looks clear. Hmm, the admiral looked more closely at the plot. What's this over here? He pointed at a fuzzy patch to the northwest of the fleet. Computer flagged it as a pot of dolphins, sir, the lieutenant, Brian's, her name tag said, replied. The patch was already past the USS Mustin and looked to be getting closer. Awfully big pod. Bigger than I've ever seen. Stiles chewed his lip for a minute and then turned to the communications section. Dot contact the Mustin. Ask them too. He was cut off by a warning buzzer and a flash of light in the distance. Mustin reports multiple detonations against her hull. She's taking on water. The sudden words sent a shock through the flag bridge. And then, Captain Rutherford has ordered the crew to abandon ship. That made Admiral Stiles' face go white. The next report was almost worse. Survivors report something in the water. It's attacking the life rafts. The Admiral made a split-second decision. Dispatch SAR birds for the survivors with gunship support. Launch torpedoes. Torpedoes weren't ideal for engaging what were essentially divers, but they were better than nothing. Vector them in on the large concentrations. Deploy marines with grenades and small arms at the railings and I want every active sonar array we have pinging. That ought to give them a migraine. The active sonar pings were powerful enough to kill fish in their vicinity. Hopefully they would do the same to whatever attackers were below. Bloodhounds loose, aiming for concentrations, a weapons control officer said, referring to the anti-submarine torpedoes launched by the escorting ships of the fleet. ETA for first detonation is 12 seconds. The explosive-filled tube shot through the water and exploded in a shower of water. Getting visuals now. It looks like. You have got to be kidding me, Admiral Stiles muttered as he watched the mangled bodies of men and women float in the waves. Unfortunately for his sanity, the lower halves were quite distinctly those of fish. What next, a giant kraken? Don't even joke about that, sir, Captain Feld, the Enterprise's captain said we don't need to give Murphy any more ammunition. Chapter 9 Ely laughed as he watched the ship ahead shudder and begin to sink. He hadn't wanted to use the merfolk at first. The honor of battle should belong to the Afalk and the Afalk alone. In fact, the only reason they were here was to occupy any ports or islands after the glory of their glorious conquest by his own troops. Dot but in the face of the ape's unexpected fighting ability, even he had to admit this fleet would need some softening up so he had ordered his reduced wing to wait for the creatures to make their way into position and begin planting their magical weapons. These limpets had been used in centuries past to oppose the Imperium, turning proud vessels to splinters in explosions of enchantment-driven power. 
Now they, like the merfolk that use them, were firmly under the control of the Afalk, and they appeared to work perfectly well against the human craft. He could have wished they had been able to destroy one of the homes of the flying beasts that had killed so many of his soldiers and their steeds, but there hadn't been time to get that close. His enchantments warned of more enemies fast approaching, and he needed to have this force taken care of before turning to meet the new threat. More of the fire-tailed projectiles came towards them from below. Again, his dragonfire swatted them from the sky with contemptuous ease. It was obvious they used them as their primary method of air battle, and they were sorely lacking in that category. Bah! The Afalk had long ago devised methods both magical and mundane to keep their own skies free of pests. They'd been forced to in the campaign to pacify the dragons and to put down any rebellion that might use them. But unlike their own enchanted weapons, these either couldn't or wouldn't dodge the fireballs and he had even seen several veer off to impact the flame instead of their original targets. What's more, they were so fragile that Ely couldn't understand how they didn't fall apart as soon as they were fired. Again he urged his riders and their beasts into battle. There was blood in the water and the air belonged to his riders. Soon the fleet would be wreckage and the Imperium would gain another world. The dragons and their riders approached the American fleet, from a wide arc, separating into eight and nine flyer formations. Dot at least three of the dragons in each were constantly scanning for missiles, hurling balls of fire into their paths as they approached. There weren't many, the humans having quickly learned the futility of such attacks. Below, the merfolk were having limited success. After the death of the USS Mustin, the fleet had been alerted to the threat and quickly responded. Human navies had long known the only asset of a diver was stealth, and with that gone the schools of fish people quickly fell prey to torpedoes as they vectored in on any sufficiently large group. Depth charges had long left the U.S. arsenal, but against unarmored forms the 300 decibel blasts of pure acoustic fury that the active sonar arrays unleashed were equally effective. Any individual that approached one of the armored giants floated up to the surface, stunned and easy pickings for marine men-at-arms. But they had provided a distraction that the formations of dragons exploited ruthlessly. Or, they thought they did. The USS Thomas Hudner, an Arleigh Burke-class destroyer, was the first ship in the American fleet to be attacked. As the incoming formation reached two and a half miles, the two phalanx Sea Whiz pods mounted on her deck began spitting bursts of 20 mm armor-piercing tungsten penetrators at a rate of 75 per second. Designed for hitting missiles traveling at multiple times the speed of sound, the first 50-round burst put 23 holes into the lead dragon. Before it had even realized it was dead, the gun had moved on to the next dragon in the flight. And then the next. And the next. Over the course of 5 seconds and 450 rounds, 9 dragons had died. Using the data from the Hudner, ships further along adjusted their burst size and began firing. Dragons fell from the sky in a rain of metal-clad meat, the closest never getting closer than a mile from a firing vessel. Worse from the perspective of the few remaining Imperium riders were the sea ram systems. Dot not only did each have one of the insanely accurate 20mm cannons, but 11 close-range surface-to-air missiles. The fleet had held them in reserve until their enemies were too close and too disorganized to put up an effective resistance. Streaking in at close to Mach 3 from close range, the deadly little missiles crossed the distance to their targets in seconds, tearing at any that had managed to escape the cannons. Commander of Wings Ely never had time to grasp any of this. He had been torn apart in the Hudner's first devastating attack. Toru Nakano, commander in the Japanese Maritime Self-Defense Force and captain of the Soryu-class attack submarine Kokoryu, looked at the sonar returns from the boat's passive systems. So far, both they, the nearby USS Louisiana, and the pair of Virginia-class attack submarines and the U.S. fleet had remained doggo, observing rather than taking an active role in the combat. It irked him more than a little. But they were under orders to stay silent and observe. Not that there was anything either could do in any case. From the sound of things, it would appear we have one, the small man said, turning to the executive officer, Lieutenant Commander Yamada. I want the crews to continue on alert for any of these Nino. And I trust we can avoid any sinking dragons? Of course, sir, the EXO responded. It was actually harder than it sounded, dodging the sinking beasts. Their metallic skin made them quite dense, and several had fallen nearby. 
one might expect something that heavy to be bound to the earth, but their wings were obviously not the only thing that kept them in the air. Luckily, there didn't appear to be any more in the vicinity, so it should be smooth sailing. Or not. Commander, what is that? Turning, Nakano saw a startled sensor tech pointing to a dark blotch on his screen. Whatever it was, it was big and fast. Larger than a cruiser, it streaked through the water with an unheard of speed. From the center, protrusions seemed to extend. Dot on the display the commander watched as one 50-meter length shot out to intercept a torpedo fired from one of the American escort destroyers. It exploded, taking a chunk of the appendage with it, but leaving the body intact. And there were quite a few more arms where that one came from. My God! Commander Nakano said, staring at the screen. It's a... Kraken! The shout in the bridge of the Enterprise drew the eyes of every man and woman in the compartment. And then they followed the motions of the terrified ensign to the shape of the USS Ford in the distance. It was as if she had suddenly sprouted a forest of hundred-foot-long tentacles, writhing across her body. Through the hastily reoriented telescopic cameras they could see several chewed through by phalanx systems fired under manual control. The damaged limbs retreated, only to be replaced moments later by even more flailing towers of sucker-studded flesh. Then, they all began to contract and pull downwards. The Ford seemed to hold still for a moment. And then, with a groan and a crack that could be heard from miles away, the flight deck gave way. Seconds later, the rest of the ship followed suit, snapping the enormous supercarrier into two. I blame you, you know. Captain Feld said to the Admiral as torpedoes and gunfire followed the dark shape now retreating into the depths. It was actually faster than many of the weapons chasing it, leaving them behind with contemptuous ease. You had to give the demon Murphy ideas. Admiral Stiles nearly laughed at the graveyard humor. And with the dark mass rapidly approaching, it was going to be their grave soon enough. Torpedoes from the handful of ships capable of hitting lanced out to meet the Leviathan, but it simply swatted them aside. Nothing could get close to it, and the Admiral didn't doubt the thing could regrow its lost limbs. He calmly picked up the radio mic. If the fleet scattered, some of them might be able to hold out long enough for heavy bombers from the mainland. Dot he opened his mouth, preparing to give the order, when a massive explosion reverberated through the hull. The crew of the Kokuryu watched acoustic data in horror as the sound of the Ford literally being torn apart reached them. A part of Nakano's mind was as stunned as those of the rest of the crew. The rest was busy methodically examining the situation, and it didn't like what it saw. Then the beast began moving in their direction. No, not their direction? Towards the Enterprise. With both of the hearts of the fleet torn out, the Kraken would be free to hunt the rest down at its leisure. Nakano had no doubt of that but watching the point on his plot move inexorably closer to the massive supercarrier, he couldn't think of any way for the American ship to survive. Every torpedo they launched was either intercepted well away from the body of the giant or outpaced by the unnaturally fast Leviathan. Enough arriving at the same time might saturate its ability to protect itself, but the majority of the fleet was out of position for that kind of coordinated fire. No, he thought, the solution dawning on him. There was one way. Helm, come about to bearing 310. Inclination of he paused for a moment, doing the rough calculations, 8 degrees. Full military power. The man at the controls hesitated for the briefest of instants before responding high. Load all tubes. Transfer arming control to my station. He could see the realization in the eyes of the bridge crew. He could see their understanding. And their determination. The commander flipped the switch activating the intercom as well as a general broadcast to any ship in range. My friends, decades ago, our country entered a dark time. Our fathers and fathers' fathers fought and died. Some say they died in vain. But whatever their reasons and motivation, they went without cowardice or dishonor. As Nakano spoke, he pressed several keys. All six torpedoes in the tubes armed themselves. Dot many went into battle knowing in no uncertain terms that they would perish in the act of defending their nation. We called them special attack forces and a divine wind. They gave their lives in hopes of taking their opponents with them. They had gained speed, moving at almost 25 knots. It was a fraction of the speed of the Kraken, 
but they had begun directly between the beast and its target. Brothers, today we fight side by side with our enemies of that war. Whatever they once were to us is no more. They are our comrades in arms. They stood between our home and these demons and sacrificed their blood to keep their honor clean. Now, I ask you, what more can we give? What more must we give? They were close now. So close, all those aboard could hear the unearthly groans emanating from the invader. Still the Kokuryu kept its course. For our country. A shock ran through the submarine as a tentacle lashed out to hammer it. The helm responded to the blow instantly bringing them back onto target. For duty. This time there was a crack as several joints gave way and water began flooding in. For honor. The Kokuryu jerked, coming to a violent halt as it hit the body of the creature. An eerie wail of unearthly pain entered the compartments of the dying submarine. Banzai. Nakano's finger stabbed down. There was a flash of light, a roar of sound, and then nothing at all and the joint Israeli-Egyptian forces are completing their mopping up in the Sinai. It had been a week since the portals had opened, spilling what humans had once believed to be the stuff of stories and dreams. Admiral Joseph Stiles knew better now. The lists of missing and dead that had come across his desk over the past seven days saw to that. But despite it being the most costly U.S. naval action since the Second World War, they had won. In fact, humanity had won. All told, there had been five arrivals as they were now called. Three, the Russian, Israeli, and Japanese had been repelled with heavy losses. Dot one had opened in southern Panama. There were scattered reports from U.S. Southcom that a handful of odd creatures had emerged, only to be wiped out by Colombian narco-traffickers. The rest had been swallowed by the jungle. As for the last group, a horde of goat men and reptilian bipeds had emerged into the Nevada desert, just 50 miles north of Las Vegas. Had it been any other city at any other time, they might have done serious damage. As it was, between Groom Lake, Nellis AFB, Creech, and the Dugway Proving Grounds there was enough military hardware in the area to swamp the approaching army. As if that wasn't enough, the invasion coincided with the annual SHOT Show. Thousands of American gun nuts, many veterans themselves, placed themselves squarely between the city and Horde. Armed with everything from surplus Russian Masson Noggins to Barrett M82 anti materiel rifles to quite a few free samples and prototypes, this impromptu militia made short work of what forces the military missed. One oft quoted shooter had quipped to the media that she had been, more worried about those rednecks and their homemade mortar than the damn goats. Now the battles were over. Humanity had survived, a little bruised and battered, but as strong as ever and soon to be getting stronger if the rumors were to be believed. Already there was talk of prisoner interrogations and unbelievable new fields of science and knowledge. But Admiral Stiles knew one thing, looking at the transcript of the last message of the Kokuryu. Humanity would honor their dead. Chapter 10 High Lord Ziga stared down with pitiless eyes as the figure below burned. It wasn't the first time Lady Trenton, former priestess of Long Visions, had felt the flames, and it likely wouldn't be the last. The searing heat charred her flesh and ate bones, but her spirit remained, chained by arcane forces. In fact, with enough magic he could make her endure endless suffering for as long as he lived, a constant reminder of the price of failure. Dot there had been several beings throughout the Imperium's history, but in deference to her years of prior service, he would likely show mercy and end the suffering well before that. A decade would likely be sufficient punishment, followed by a final, public execution. He might even wield the executioner's axe himself. Still, it was a fitting reward for the catastrophe her carelessness had spawned. Legions of the Imperium's best forces had been committed to what should have, by all accounts, been a simple pacification campaign. Instead, one by one, the forces had gone silent. The throne room had slowly gone from a scene of celebration and feasting to horror as, one by one, the armies met their foes and were utterly crushed. Final, scattered reports had told of weapons of unheard of power and resistance on a scale the Afauk hadn't seen in millennia. To make matters worse for the chart, mewling remains of Trenton, three of the dragon riders dispatched during the ritual of translocation had been direct sons and grandsons of the reigning High Lord. 
their deaths had played no small part in her sentence of undying torture. Now, the undisputed ruler of 26 universes stared east towards the distant camps of the army of his revenge. Forces of every one of the conquered planets had assembled in unprecedented numbers. Feeding them alone had strained the capital's infrastructure nearly to breaking, but any price was acceptable. Nearby, arcane adepts worked feverishly preparing the largest ritual of translocation ever to be attempted. Souls of thousands of sacrifices were spent like water to charge massive pools of raw magic. Hundreds of master builders aided by the labor of legions of slaves worked around the clock to construct the three largest temples ever designed to focus those energies. It would all serve a single purpose, to crush these humans. It was costing the Imperium dearly. Money wasn't an object, the treasury's coffers were deep, and though the campaign would be expensive, it would not bankrupt them. Dot no, it was costing in political capital, a much rarer and more valuable currency than gold and jewels would ever be. The high Afauk were beginning to chafe under the lack what had once been the most basic goods and services. Many had been drafted to replace losses or expand formations, leading to more unrest. Worse, from Ziga's perspective, was that some of the nobles were beginning to feel the impact as their own luxuries were restricted. Push them too hard, and he knew they would launch a coup. Not that it could ever succeed, but it would set preparations back quite some time. As it was, they just needed to continue for three months. For it would be just three months' time, and then the portal would be would be ready to activate and this time no surprises would stand in their way of complete and total victory. At the thought of the planet of the humans burning into a blackened cinder, the High Lord smiled. You sure it's the place? Positive. Matches the descriptions perfectly. And if they lied? We're screwed, but I doubt they all lied. True. So, we call it in? Don't see any reason why not. Go ahead and pull out the crystal ball. Ha! Never thought I'd be using one of these when I signed up. It was a bit after four in the morning, local time. The stars were fading and there was a grey tinge to the air, but otherwise the darkness was absolute. Small animals rustled and a few nocturnal predators made calls of triumph or loss as they hunted their prey but the dawn chorus wouldn't begin for several hours. Some humans would call it BMNT, before morning nautical twilight. Historically, it was when armies would launch their attacks, catching sleeping troops and fatigued sentries unaware. This was one such morning. The Afaux ritual of translocation transported all living beings inside a large sphere between universes. There were smaller portals that were used for day-to-day -day travel between conquered worlds. These required magical anchors at both ends to stabilize and would dissipate if either side were damaged. Dot what appeared in the forest to the east of the Afauk capital were neither. They resembled the dimension linking portals more than anything else, except these were unanchored. And enormous. Nearly 200 meters in diameter, they were easily the largest gateways this world had ever seen. Through the holes in space poured humans by the thousands. Some came by foot, others on vehicles that traveled on track, tread, or simple wheels. A few entered a new world by more unconventional means. The trucks and tanks and shoulder patches bore a variety of insignia never seen before. The stars and stripes of the United States advanced alongside the tricolor of the Russian Federation. Stars of David intermingled with Korean Taeguki while infantry bearing the Union Jack hitched rides on tanks with the Black Eagle of Germany. Nearly every major nation on earth, along with quite a few minor ones, was represented in those rapidly spreading columns. Only China and France were conspicuous in their absence, though many were quietly thankful the latter had refrained from joining the coalition with its history of poisoning alliances through political mismanagement of their armed forces. The former had simply refused to subordinate their units to another power, and though the Chinese military was enormous, sheer weight of numbers wasn't going to win this fight. The bright California light shining through one of the portals momentarily darkened. It was replaced by a wall of metal that dwarfed all but the most massive constructions on this new planet. Even more astounding, it was moving under its own power, actually hovering several meters above the ground as it did so. With a speed that belied its form, the mountain of steel cruised soundlessly through the gate. It was the USS Enterprise, CVN-80, bristling with dozens of aircraft on her flat top. 
and she was here to get some of her own back from the people who had tried to kill her just a few short months before. Launch the cap, Commander. Dot Admiral Stiles didn't pay much attention to the reply, besides noting it occurred. He was too focused on savoring this moment. The eight months since the flashes, as the media had taken to calling, them had been among the busiest of his life. In fact, it had been the busiest humanity had ever experienced. Thousands of the otherworldly invaders had been captured across all five landing sites. It didn't take long for the linguists to open up communication and then the information really started to rush in. Not just concerning the invasion, which was pure imperialism as far as anyone on earth was concerned. No, the biggest changes by far were a direct result of the magical abilities they all seemed to exhibit. Between interrogations and examinations of captured artifacts, human scientists had managed to reverse engineer a great many spells and mated them with human technology in a field already being called alchemy. Now the Enterprise moved forward on new anti-gravity drives to make way for the converted USS Zumbalt. Newer ships were already being designed from the ground up to take advantage of the new alchemical developments, but for now the militaries of the Earth were using converts. But for what they had planned, the converted surface ships should be plenty. Sir, the Air Force is requesting permission to launch, a nearby lieutenant said. Requesting are they? He asked, rhetorically. I've never known them to request anything. That was another of the changes that would take more than a little getting used to. With VTOL now a matter of bolting on a handful of small modules, the need for a catapult and special landing gear had been eliminated. While the ships themselves still made excellent mobile logistics bases and command and control centers, specialty carrier-based aircraft were slowly being phased out in favor of more powerful land-based jets. And since the major operator of such warplanes was the Air Force, Never mind, signal the good colonel. Dot tell him to go ahead and launch. Admiral Stiles turned back to the forward ports in time to see a dozen planes rise up from the deck as if lifted by invisible strings. Definitely going to take some getting used to. Chapter 11 Swordbearer Zheng Young quietly made his way out of the stout stone and timber longhouse that made up the barracks for his company. In that, he knew they were luckier than most. The Dragon's Bane Regiment had long been stationed near the capital city, which meant that their loggings were as well. The arriving forces had quickly overflowed the transient barracks armies of conquest usually occupied before the ritual of translocation. The vast tent cities they were forced to live in were by all accounts cold, wet, and miserable. Meals were cold and often stale while the paths between encampments were muddy, dung-filled scrapings at best. Even with the help of healers, plague was beginning to creep through the masses of poorly sheltered soldiers. Not my problem, he muttered to himself, shrugging internally. And not that even an afalc of his low rank would be stuck in something as plebeian as a tent. The poorest of the afalc soldiers could have been sure of at least a bed under a real roof. Maybe not as nice as they felt they deserved, but infinitely better than what the average orc was given. However, the sleeping conditions of the masses were far from Jang Young's mind as he loosened his trousers in order to relieve a growing pressure. It was then the young soldier noticed a rumble in the distance. It sounded like thunder, except there was no storm to be seen. And instead of falling off, this thunder just kept going. In fact, now that he concentrated it sounded like it was growing louder. No, it was definitely growing louder, and coming from the east. Turning to face the strange noise he was the only being in the encampment to see first massive armored monster crash through the eastern walls. The behemoth was quickly followed by two more, heads turning to bring long protrusions to the front. Dot Zheng Young was stunned. A full-grown dragon might have been able to breach the strong timber palisades. These beasts broke through as if they were made of straw. I wonder the swordbearer's thoughts were cut off as the turret on the Russian T-14B Armada tank terrible lined up with the closest barracks and the main gun seemed to explode. It was as if the gods themselves had shaken the world. Even twenty spans away from the building, Jang Young was knocked backwards by the blast. Splinters and shards or metal stung him, but he hardly noticed, so great was the pure concussive shock. But he was lucky. Of the nearly eighty a falcon inside, only three were still alive as the dust began to settle, and their wounds meant they would all be passing on very soon. Jang Young struggled to his feet, ears ringing. Quickly, 
he searched for the crater the Iron Beast must have left when it exploded. No. It can't be. Rather than a smoking hole, Terrible remained intact in a thinning cloud of dust. Then the other two tanks and the squad opened fire as their main guns came to bear. Two more longhouses were reduced to bloody splinters, and Zhang Young once again was knocked to the ground, bladder finally releasing in fear and shock. Meanwhile, at least some of the regiment had enough wits about them to respond. Spears, arrows, and blasts of magical energy began to arc towards the lead tank. The enchanted weapons and arcane fury should have been enough to destroy a small village. Instead, they seemed to skid along an invisible surface just beyond its metallic body before falling harmlessly away. Zheng Young, again managing to pull his battered and stained body up, was incredulous. Not possible. By Ziga, that's just not possible. The whispered words, half prayer and half denial, had no effect whatsoever on the tank. It obviously had shielding of some sort, but as hard as he tried, the young swordbearer couldn't sense one. Which was just. Not possible. To shrug off that sort of attack would require the power of three master mages and ought to radiate so much energy a blind tuberfly could sense it. Dot instead, there was nothing. Another moment passed as the metal monster considered its attackers, almost as a man would consider a particularly annoying fly. Its muzzle shifted, there was a flash, a blast, and the attacks died off to near nothing. Then a smaller device mounted on top let loose a rattle, a long stream of flashing seeming to connect it and the ruins. A few moments later the last of the defenders fell silent. Minutes after the last guard fell, the three tanks were gone. Behind them they left a ruined encampment, a regiment's worth of dead or dying a falc, and one trembling swordbearer with sodden pants curled up behind a tree. Control to Tiger 3, be advised, mounted infantry in the open 18 miles from your position, bearing 115. Roger Sky I, Tiger 3 breaking to engage. Major Robert Rosker a strongman, USAF, banked his A-10D, knowing his wingman Captain Fred Mobius Bakker was listening in and would be right on his tail. Snakeskin, you there? He radioed to his escort. Read you Rosker's. If the naval aviator felt miffed at being assigned to guard a couple of Air Force jets, his voice didn't show it. I assume you have some customers? That's affirmative, snakeskin. Keep the vultures off our backs. Strongman checked his new course and made a small adjustment. It was odd flying without GPS, but if there were any satellites orbiting above this planet, they weren't on the human side. Still, most nations had long worked with the knowledge such systems could and would be destroyed or jammed at the first sign of large-scale hostility. U.S. aircraft had been equipped with inertial guidance systems to give location data and the forces at the gates were broadcasting a navigation signal. Between the two, he knew exactly where he was. The A-10 is a sturdy aircraft that relies on dealing and taking huge quantities of damage while providing close air support. It had originally been designed during the Cold War to blunt the advance of thousands of Soviet tanks pouring through the Fulda Gap. Dot those tanks never came, and the gun for which it was famous would most likely have proved ineffective against the armor of the more modern among them. But it was still an incredibly powerful and versatile aircraft, and it had proved itself repeatedly in battlefields across the Middle East during the late 20th and early 21st century. It was only the threat of modern anti-aircraft weaponry and interceptors that had prompted the push for their retirement. The Afauk had no such weapons. Major Strongman brought his aircraft in at a shallow angle from several thousand feet. There was no point in rapid dives or ground-skimming attacks against this bunch. Not anymore, at least. When his bird was 6,000 feet from the formation, he depressed the trigger on his flight stick and the A-10's main gun belched light and sound. 30 mm high explosive rounds detonated throughout the column of exposed cavalry. The range was a little long, but it didn't make much difference. Horses and riders fell, magically augmented armor perforated by notched steel wire or opened like tin cans by depleted uranium penetrators. The fortunate died instantly. Others lingered, gasping through lungs rapidly filling with blood or struggling to hold entrails inside of bellies. The Major kept the trigger depressed for a full 20 seconds as he made his pass. Through the cockpit window, he could see Bakker doing the same. It wouldn't have been possible in the old A-10C models. 
they carried only a bit over 15 seconds worth of ammunition at the main gun's astounding 4200 rounds per minute rate of fire. The alchemical innovations in the D variant meant that both the aircraft's range and ammunition supply were effectively infinite, the tanks and magazines linked to far larger reserves back on Earth. For all the surprise and carnage, a handful of mages were alert enough to send several ragged bursts of return fire, magical bolts of energy that seemed to home in on the aircraft with deadly precision. Dot, but as soon as they got within 50 feet of the fuselage, they veered off, victims of the newly designed and produced repulsion fields. Anything with a hint of arcane power to it would find itself shoved violently away as soon as it got anywhere near the A-10's body. Snakeskin, you get that? He asked over the radio, now pulling back to cruising altitude. Got it Rosgris. Not many left. A couple dozen, tops, he could hear the satisfaction in the fellow aviator's voice over the crystal clear audio. Your call on another pass. I've literally got all day. The same technology that allowed the A-10D's cannons to be fed from faraway magazines gave the fighter effectively unlimited range. Strongman grinned. It was about what he had expected, which meant. No point, snakeskin. They're not going to be bothering anyone. Switching frequencies, he radioed, Command, Tiger 3. Enemy mounted units destroyed. Request new targets. Thanks Rosgris came the reply. Good to hear. Wait one for new targets. Hey, Rosgris, Snakeskin called over the comms as Sky is signed off. Mind making a detour over to the east? Picking up some dragons who've never seen a jet before. Figured I could give them a demonstration. Oh, by all means, Snakeskin, the pilot replied, a wry grin on his face. Wouldn't want to deprive them of that experience. Just make sure it's a real once-in-a-lifetime show. Chapter 12 The American Liaison reports the column has been destroyed, and asks if we require any assistance in reducing the fortress, an RTO said to Colonel Krantz, commander of the reconstituted IDF Galani Brigade. The heavy-set, dark-featured man had been one of the few field-grade officers left following the Suez Canal defense. Immediate superior dead, then Major Krantz had rallied the remnants of his battalion, repelling the attackers until the Egyptian relief arrived. Afterwards, he had been given a field promotion and put in charge of the entire brigade for the mop-up operations. Dot later, Krantz had worked around the clock getting Galani back to its original size and capability. Signal our thanks for the support. And tell them. I believe the term is we've got this. The RTO Dash who had also been Krantz's RTO during the Battle of the Suez, nodded gravely at the colonel's words before cracking a wide grin. Then he saluted and left to relay the message. Colonel Krantz stepped out of his park command vehicle and peered at the large stone and earthwork structure several kilometers ahead of his arrayed forces. The castle was their primary objective for this phase and they needed to capture it relatively intact. Of course, a little breakage was expected. The ghosts of the men and women he'd fought and died with demanded as much. As he thought about the hell he had been through during the last battle his thoughts went back to General Kaufman and he almost chuckled. The old warhorse had nearly gone ballistic when command had ordered him to remain in the rear to coordinate the three Israeli brigades engaged rather than come to the front. But it was no place for a flag officer and he had made sure to order Krantz to pick a souvenir up for him. On his orders, artillery was moving into position to begin shelling the fortifications. Three batteries of M109 self-propelled 155mm howitzers were under his command and he intended to use them to their best effect. The tubes elevated, tracked on some invisible point above the fortress, and paused, almost expectantly. Kilometers closer to the fortress, Krantz saw his XO, Lt. Col. Rosenberger, approaching. Colonel, the artillery is sighted in and our infantry are ready to advance. A short, no-nonsense woman, the former captain had been in charge of an engineering company during the Battle of the Suez. As the only officer left in a large swath of the front, she had taken over command of a pair of line companies, and later an entire battalion. Krantz had a feeling that a big chunk of the efficiency of his unit owed a lot to the diminutive woman. Dot. Thank you, Lieutenant Colonel, he replied. I don't think we should keep these people in suspense then, should we? Seconds later, 
the 18 guns of the artillery complement rumbled in the distance. They were dug in almost 10 kilometers to his rear, and for good reason. Over 30 seconds, each tube fired three rounds, varying the charge and elevation of each shot. The trajectories were carefully calculated with malice aforethought and a practice dating back to just before the Second World War. The time on target barrage ensured that rather than falling individually or in small groups, all every one of the shots hit in a single, concentrated volley. All 54 of them. Multiple explosions rocked the Afauk fortress. It had magical protection, of course. Its shield was strong enough to protect it for weeks on its own, even against a group armed with high explosives and high energy penetrators. With the reinforcement of 20 battle mages, it was impervious to any weapon ever used on an Afauk world, and would probably even stand up to a small nuke. The 155mm howitzer was not from one of their planets. In fact, until recently this particular shell, the M785E-AA, high explosive slash alchemically augmented round, hadn't existed on Earth, either. The weapon was a rushed product of designers searching for some method of penetrating the magical barriers that had proved so effective months before. The M785 filled this role nicely. As soon as the round approached a shield, internal systems would analyze its composition and briefly project a matching field around the projectile. As the two met, the larger would absorb the smaller into itself. As it did, the shell would find itself inside the barrier and free to detonate inside the vulnerable center of an enemy formation. These shells did just that, blasting chunks and bodies out of fortifications never designed to withstand the raw power of high explosives. Worse, a handful of the weapons were incendiaries, spitting fragments of white phosphorus throughout the area. Dot frantic defenders attempted to extinguish the small, smoking embers only to find water had no effect. Soon much of the fortress was shrouded in a dense fog lit by the hellish glow of burning timbers. And then the next volley arrived. From the outside, Colonel Krantz watched as the enemy fortress rocked from another series of impacts, with a third already on its way. The air around it suddenly seemed to shimmer as a dull haze almost solidified. Then the whole thing popped as if a massive bubble. As the confined smoke began to drift away, the humans got their first good look at the structure. Once proud stone walls and sturdy timber frames had been blasted apart by the explosive fury. The central keep still stood, a testament to sturdy engineering and no doubt magical reinforcement. Still, it sported crumbling holes and gaping rents across its sides. Turning to the exo, Krantz said, begin the assault. Time the last volley to hit 90 seconds before our leading formation. It would be risky letting artillery hit so close to his men, but better to keep the enemy shell shocked for as long as they could than give them time to plot. Yes sir, was her only reply as she walked over to a nearby Humvee and began speaking into a radio. Several dozen Namer APCs sped off towards the fortress, dust clouds shooting up behind their fast-moving treads. As they approached, one final time on target barrage from the artillery hammered the stone structure, airburst keeping the defenders under cover but doing little additional damage to fort. It was replaced by heavy machine gun and grenade fire from the transports as they entered effective range. They disgorged their troops to no effective opposition, and the IDF infantry quickly began clearing the buildings. There had been arguments back on earth that melee weapons like swords, spears, and knives had advantages over rifles in enclosed spaces. The IDF were past masters of close quarters battle and quickly disproved any such notions. Dot bullpup Tabor spat death into figures stunned by the brilliant light and sound of flashbangs. And there was no time to regroup or plan a counterattack. The infiltrators simply breached a room, cleared it, and moved deeper into the structure. Reaching a staircase, the team split, one group climbing the spire and the next descending to the basement. More men and women secured the ground floor while a cordon surrounded the walls to capture any escapees. Meanwhile, half a dozen Macbeths of the air defense battery moved up, ready to perforate any dragons or other aerial beasts that might slip past the covering fighters with their 20mm Vulcans. From his expression, no one would have known how nervous Colonel Krantz was. He wasn't worried overly much about his men and women. They were well trained and equipped for the mission. He didn't have a single doubt in their ability to take the fortress. No, taking the fortress was important, but the structure itself wasn't the goal of the operation. 
his radio crackled to life and the colonel keyed the speaker, Galani Actual, report. Galani Actual, Bravo 6, the caller said, identifying himself as the commander of Bravo Company of the assaulting battalion. Package is secure, we're putting it in the bag right now. Colonel Krantz actually smiled in relief before answering, Roger Bravo 6, congratulations on securing the prize. And please pass my thanks down to your troops. Galani, out. That was going to throw a serious wrench into the enemy's command and control loop. And yet if Krantz really couldn't bring himself to find any sympathy for the beings that had killed so many of his friends just a few months before. Even better, it looked like the general would get his souvenir. The communications crystal through which High Lord Ziga was verbally flaying an underling suddenly emitted a loud wail and went blank. The screech, an otherworldly noise like the scraping of steel on Dragonhide, continued on for several seconds until High Lord brought his fist down onto the offending device and shattered it into a dozen pieces. Dot its echo seemed to continue on, though. In fact, they showed no sign of abating, and the gathered nobles realized it wasn't simply an echo. Find out what in the hells is going on. Ziga commanded. Half a dozen retainers rushed to obey, terrified of incurring their lord and master's wrath. A few moments later, a pale-faced Afauk entered the chamber. Ziga recognized him as one of the masters of communication he kept on the palace grounds. He was also the most junior, likely volunteered by his superiors to deliver an unpalatable piece of news. My lord, the frightened mage stammered. I don't know how I mean, it doesn't seem possible and I'm doing my best to stop it, but I've never seen anything like it and. Ziga slammed his hand down with a crack like a gavel and ordered, enough with your yammering. You will tell me what is going on immediately or I will have you fed to the Gora. A pet of the High Lord, the Gora was known by some as the Soul Sucker. Not content with devouring flesh, it would drain the life and magical essence from its victim. The unfortunate Afauk seemed to freeze, then inhale deeply before speaking again, more coherently this time. Sire, all of our communication spells have been affected by some sort of corruption. I don't know how, but these invaders must have disrupted them. And can you fix them? The High Lord asked, coldly. I don't know how, Your Highness, the Master of Communication replied, voice quavering. We have never seen anything like it. New spells appear unaffected, but our entire network up until this point has been destroyed. We think it might have started at the Crystal Keep. Lord Baholon was reporting it was in the process of being overrun by the invaders before there was some sort of loud explosion. Then we caught a glimpse of one of them with an odd device before, well, this. The last word came out as more of a squeak than anything. Ziga looked the cowering figure for a moment and then said, Get up. Dot I still have need of your services. He found the sudden flash of hope in the underling's eyes pathetic. You will prepare new communication spells. You will have them delivered to the Avery where our fastest falcons will take them to our armies and fortresses. And you will ensure that something like this can never happen again. If you do not, I advise you slit your own throat, because I will not be so merciful in the future. The pitiful figure babbled thanks as he backed away through the door to carry out the commands. A piercing glare stilled the rest of the gathered nobles and retainers. Now, he began, can any of you shed the slightest bit of light on what is going on here? Or should I rip out your souls where you sit and replace them with no doubt more competent spirits of beasts? From the icy tone and stone-hard eyes of the High Lord, no one had any illusions that it was an idle threat. Your Eminence, the new Lord of Visions, Sir Kalahili said, breaking the silence, I have no doubt this is an as yet undiscovered race of lesser Efauk. We have conquered such worlds before and know their fighting power approaches our own. It skirted blasphemy, insinuating that the high Efauk weren't the undisputed masters of magic and creation, but at this time the assembled parties were willing to overlook the transgression in the face of such overwhelming evidence. And if they aren't? A voice in the crowd asked. Could it be the humans? They certainly did something to our initial invasion. Kalahili shot a glare at the young lord who had spoken before calming his features. That was one possibility I had considered, and then rejected. We retained some communication during the battles on that world. Everyone was adamant that the humans had no magical abilities of their own. 
and without those, how would they hope to attack us? No, it's simply bad luck that these newcomers attacked so close on the heels of our defeat. The last word came out grudgingly, for it had been centuries at least since a force of the Imperium had been bested on the field of battle. Dot. It is bad luck. For them. The words from Ziga startled the Lord of Visions. In fact, our minor inconvenience with the humans may prove our salvation today. I believe I see the hands of the gods in this. The entire room was silent, not sure if their ruler was mad or had truly come across some strategic insight. Fools, look out the window. He gestured to a nearby viewing slit. Through it were the gathered hosts of the Imperium, assembled to crush the defiant humans of Earth. But their unanticipated presence would just as well annihilate anyone foolish enough to try to invade the heart of the Imperium. For the first time in hours, the group gathered in that chamber began to smile a long-toothed, predatory grin. It was not a pretty sight. Chapter 13 Thunderbird 1, Control. You are cleared to proceed to Point Silverplate and await orders. There is a large furball approximately 23 miles northeast of the position. Exercise caution, in excess of 600 dragons and several hundred smaller bogies reported. Raptors and flankers are keeping them contained. Confirmed, looking glass. Coming around on new heading, maintaining altitude and airspeed, confirmed the commander of the B-1B Lancer, Colonel Rob Harper. The co-pilot, Lt. Col. Kerry Klinsmann, brought the massive aircraft around 90 degrees in a smooth arc that nonetheless covered nearly 10 miles. A cruising speed of over Mach 1 would do that. And he was fairly certain their altitude of nearly Angels 50 would keep the local rabble well away from his bird. The aircraft, named Spectre by a previous crew, was flying with a pair of F-35s as escort. In the distance, they could see a Tupolev Tu-160 with its own escorts moving onto a similar path. Such an unusual sight had become almost commonplace over the past months. Coalition drills had brought the two militaries closer than they had been even at the height of the Second World War. There was still quite a bit of rivalry, but with an external threat to focus on it tended to be generally good-natured. Dot. Apparently there's a bit of a battle going on to the north, the colonel commented. Why don't we take a look? The question was directed at Captain Pachis, the defensive systems controller. It also put him in control of the extensive radar and sensor suite present in the high-tech bomber. Yes, sir, the man replied, turning to his displays. A moment later he announced, imagery is on your screen. To most, it would appear a dense mass of cryptically labeled dots and lines. To Harper, the scene seemed to unfold as if he were watching it with his own two eyes. Those new missiles are really doing the trick, he muttered to himself. Based on input from American pilots in the Battle of the Sea of Japan, designers had modified the programming of American Sidewinders and AIM 120s as well as Russian Archer and Adder missiles. Instead of straight line paths, they dodged and wove through storms of fire. Many were obviously being lost to enemy fire, but more were getting through, and the masses of flying beasts were being slowly kited to the north by a fraction their number of modern fighters. And it really didn't hurt that seconds after a missile was launched, a new one appeared on the racks. A flashing light brought the colonel's attention back to the task at hand. Looking glass, looking glass, this is Thunderbird 1. We are in position and standing by. The supersonic jet reduced speed and began circling its designated target at an altitude where angels feared to tread. Below, lost amongst the height and wisps of clouds, were millions of creatures of all shapes and sizes. To the high-powered cameras mounted in the Lancer's body, it looked like a kicked anthill was surging to the east to meet the advancing human forces. Even with their superior technology and new alchemical knowledge, Harper doubted that the human forces could stand off such a horde. Well, the fortifications just inside the gates probably could, but not the troops outside of them. For all their individual bravery and deadly skill, the human soldiers would be washed over by the tide coming to meet them. Dot. And then the call he had been dreading and hoping for came through, Thunderbird 1, looking glass. Confirm authorization for Case New York. Authorization Juliet. Lima. 4. 6. Niner. 4. Romeo. 7. Confirm. Co. 
confirmed looking glass, Colonel Harper said, throat suddenly dry. Authorization Juliet Lima 469 or 4 Romeo 7. Beginning our run. Turning to a pale-faced Captain Bushman, the crew weapons officer, he said formally, I have received a valid release code from National Command Authority. Do you concur? I concur that a valid release authorization has been received, the man said, very clearly and formally for the sake of procedure and the cockpit recorders. Acknowledged, Harper said, now entering the code into a small panel. Several lights turned from solid green to a blinking, bloody reed. Pilot, line us up for our run. Both the American B-1B and the now distant Russian Tu-160 straightened from their circling at opposite ends of the large valley. As they approached invisible points in the sky, both opened large doors and an identical object fell from the bellies of each aircraft. Immediately after separation, the bombers and their escorts engaged their afterburners and sped away from their drop points at all possible speed. The bombs that fell away had both been part of a joint Russian-American design program. It was both the first and largest of its kind. Considerable time and effort had gone into ensuring the weapons functioned exactly as designed. Despite that, this was the first field test they would be getting, and it had been decided that using two would ensure one fizzle wouldn't delay the attack. It took over two minutes for the weapons to descend from their release point, plenty of time for both bombers and their escorts to reach a minimum safe distance. Then, as they passed below the lip of the looming mountainside, small altimeters registered their positions. A quick electronic conversation spanning milliseconds took place, the bombs synchronizing their positions and readiness. Dot moments later, both weapons exploded in an eye-searing brilliance that outshone the sun. Tens of thousands were instantly blinded by the pure photonic shock of the event, retinas permanently burned out in the flash. That blindness quickly became irrelevant as a shockwave of fusion spawned fury scoured the valley free of life. Mountain walls channeled the blasts, focusing it out either end and spawning whirlwinds of heat and destruction that ensured not a single member of the Imperial host survived. Over the next several days, human parties would begin to filter into the valley. The once forested and snow-capped peaks had been stripped by nuclear fire and fury, but the land itself was clean. Instead of the deadly fallout other human weapons released, these were clean fusion bombs. On Earth, Alchemical advances had allowed the construction of half a dozen clean He 3 deuterium power plants. Here on the Afalc homeworld, the knowledge had spawned a new generation of thermonuclear destruction. As Colonel Harper looked at the twin mushroom clouds through a tinted cockpit visor, he couldn't really bring himself to feel all that bad about it. They had infiltrated several hours before the main human force arrived. Coming through man sized gates in the black of night, the two teams had escaped any notice by unsuspecting sentries. Later, as troops rushed left and right to defend the keep from the approaching invaders they remained hidden, silent and waiting. It was just after they felt the telltale rumble of a not-so-distant nuclear detonation that they struck. The shield surrounding the High Lord's palace was incredibly strong. Orders of magnitude more so than the one the Golani Brigade had shattered. It was also triple-walled, preventing the same trick of artillery that broke Crystal Keep's defenses. Unfortunately for its inhabitants, a barrier only keeps those on the outside out. It does nothing against the rats already in the walls. Members of the U.S. SEAL Team 6 and Russian Spetsnaz commandos from the 3rd Special Purpose Brigade scaled the 30-meter ramparts surrounding the fortress with noiseless ease. Dot not one of the guards saw the figures pulling themselves over the lip. Then there was a flash of dull steel and a muted cough of silenced, small caliber pistols and none of those guards would have to worry about spotting intruders ever again. Their bodies were dragged to small alcoves and hidden away. In seconds, the only testaments to the violence were a handful of stains on the dark stone walls. Both groups ghosted across the courtyard, their newly manufactured armor turning them into literal wraiths as it mimicked the surrounding terrain. When they were moving, the already stealthy commandos looked like a gust of wind and a trick of the light. Standing still, they were nearly impossible to distinguish from the background. The teams used this to full advantage, scaling the second, higher wall and again dispatching the sentries without incident. Arriving at the heavy doors and narrow windows of the main castle, the teams prepped for the final phase of the operation. Breaching charges were laid and detonators primed. 
The SEALs and Spetsnaz exchanged a quick radio confirmation of readiness before triggering the blasts. Now they were on the clock, and not just in terms of the now alerted reinforcements. No, there was a far more important reason to finish as quickly as possible because, by time-honored tradition, the loosing group would be buying the first round. One might normally expect that a castle on a world no human had visited before that day would have been an intelligence black hole. Between a handful of a fout captured and interrogated following their invasion and a very sophisticated set of portable ground-penetrating radar, they actually had quite a good idea of the layout of the palace from the ballrooms to kitchens to bedchambers to servants' passages to the high muckety-muck's favorite audience chamber. That was where they were headed. The Americans breached through a small sally port into a guard-ready room. The door had never been designed to hold off several pounds of shaped high explosives and shattered into splinters that perforated several of the soldiers nearby. Dot the rest found themselves peppered with the high-velocity steel fragments driven by even more explosives as a cooked grenade was tossed through the hole. A pair of quick, suppressed rifle shots finished the last survivor who had been sheltered by a small protrusion. Russians being Russian, the Spetsnaz team set their explosive charges on a blank stone wall. Invisible from the outside, but obvious to their scanning equipment, the wall was quite a bit thinner than the rest, concealing a small passage used to discreetly deliver courtesans to the bedchambers of visiting nobles. Piling through the opening, the team rushed down the corridor until they reached a small doorway. A swift kick sent it slamming open, knocking a startled guard onto the ground. A shot from the point man's rifle kept him there, and then the rest of the unit poured out and into the larger hall. They went through the defenders like a pair of hot knives through butter. Guard after guard fell, enchanted armor perforated by high-velocity lead, explosively driven steel, and sheer concussive force. One group managed to form a small barricade, huddling behind overturned furniture with spears extended and bows at hand. A satchel charge and a few rifle shots reduced the defense to wreckage and sent the few survivors running. As they approached the High Lord's audience chamber, a desperate guard platoon counterattacked, hurling magic and steel as they charged down the humans' throats. For all their bravery, these guards were chosen more for their political connections than battlefield prowess. When the last defalc fell, they had only managed to take a single human with them. There was a flash of dark blue flesh in front of the Spetsnaz. One of the men fell, a snarling eight-legged form taking him to the floor. The beast was the size of a lion, but had smooth almost oily skin and an oddly toothless mouth. But fangs or no, it was several hundred kilos of hard muscle and it easily pinned the struggling form as it latched onto the man's neck with its empty maw. Dot then it paused, as if confused by the now visible human below it. That was just enough time for the soldier to yank a combat knife out of its sheath and drive it up through the beast's jaw, pinning it to the roof of its mouth. Shocked by the pain it jumped away and was quickly riddled with holes as the would-be victim rolled away from the line of fire. As his armor turned once again translucent, they formed up outside of the final doorway and prepared to breach. By then, the seals had reached their own entry point. Both groups paused for a moment to coordinate, and then more explosives detonated, shredding a side entrance and a servant's door. Flashbangs followed with human soldiers right on their heels. Electronic earplugs and next-generation night vision equipment muted the bursts of light and noise. In fact, the point men had a very clear view of a large, splendidly appointed room with lush carpets, enormous chairs, heaps of food and wine, and a dozen well-dressed afout gaping in horror at the apparitions that had reached their inner sanctum. The ensuing twenty seconds saw one more human killed and all twelve of the nobles riddled with more holes than Swiss cheese. Still, it only took a moment to identify the leader. As they began the grisly task of removing the head from the body, the two groups exchanged good-natured insults. Comments about dubious parentage, poor aim, terrible navigational skills, and half a dozen other time-honored subjects were exchanged in two different languages. Makabe souvenir in hand and a pair of parting gifts left on the floor, the human combat teams exited as one. Racing through halls and passageways, they sought to get as much distance between themselves and the massacre as possible. Their escape was aided by the distractions they had left along their entry. Explosives ranging from simple noisemakers to blocks of C4 went off by timer and remote. Panic reigned, through which the humans made their way to safety. Just beyond the outer wall, 
there was a patch of space-time that had been twisted and mutilated by man. Dot now, it linked two worlds with a joint just large enough for a full-grown man to pass through. One by one, the human special forces filed through the portal. As the last one entered, he held up a bulging plastic bag and the entire room burst into cheers. And then the fortress vanished into a brilliant ball of fire before the portal snapped shut behind them. The portal snapped shut behind them.